Mr. Crockett? Mr. Dillon? Here. Mr. Loisel? Here. Mr. Massisso? Mr. Maroon? Here. Mr. Richard? Mr. Stark? Here. Okay. Now stand for Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, just a couple of housekeeping things. Uh, we have four people on the board tonight present. If one more person comes, they'll be active. Uh, however, if a tie vote is a means it won't, the decision will not go in your favor. So you need at least three people to actually have the affirmative vote. So you're aware of that. Um, and also the schedule's long, and at 10.30 we may not, at 10.30 we, we, so that will be the last appeal. And uh, so I, will, I want to warn you that you may end up having to come back next month, but we'll do the best we can to move it along. Uh, and if people can talk relatively quickly, that would be respectful of the people behind them. And uh, why don't we jump into uh, you know, approval of the minutes for October 9th, 2013. So moved. Seconded. Discussion? Please, all in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you very much. And we'll jump into appeal number 2509. It's an administrative appeal by Jeffrey and Lisa Shaw, 15 Maple Avenue, Assessor's Map U47, Parcel 85, against the decision of the code enforcement officers. Notice of violation for the vehicle repair business in the R2 zone. And with us today, we have the attorney uh, Sauce here. And uh, he's just going to give us a little bit of an overview and to be here as, as, as needed. Thank you. It's my first time being here in person, so uh, nice to meet you guys. Um, Phil Saucer, one of the town attorneys for, for Scarborough from uh, Bernstein Shore. And I'm just here for this first appeal. Um, this is an administrative appeal where you're going to review the decision of the Code Enforcement Office. And that's what we call uh, an appellate review. So you're going to review the decision to see if he was in error in his decision and the evidence that he's going to put forward that he made his decision on, or the office, I should say, made the decision on. Um, I would recommend, and the chair <laughs> said the chair's decision that the way you'd proceed is let the appellant go first and, okay. and uh, sort of make their case, um, uh, make their arguments against the notice of violation and why it's an error, and then allow the code office to come forward and present the evidence that they used to, to come up with their decision, and then you would deliberate on that. Allow public hearing, I should say, next, um, that people who want to speak on this other than the appellant and the code office, and then deliberate to see if the code office was an error based on the, uh, the evidence that's in the record. Thank you. Any questions for our attorney at this time? Okay. So uh, do we have <coughs> Mr. and Mrs. Shaw here, Jeffrey and Lisa Shaw? Great. Could you uh, do me a favor and stand up by the microphone, take you, state your name and address, and we'll go from there. <clears throat> um, hi, my name is Lisa Shaw, 15 Maple Ave, Scarborough. Okay. And uh, if you'd like to explain what the circumstances are that bring you here today, we'll, we'll go from there. We'll help you out as we go along. Um, yeah, we were cited for um, the violations, and I feel that they're unjust. Um, we were told by um, Tom Edinsborough that we were allowed to have two vehicles unregistered on our property and we could work inside the garage okay. and I don't understand what all this is about. My nephew um, moved out in July, the middle of July. There was no activity at all at the house until he returned for a family wedding and cleaned up the what was left over at the uh, house in the garage. On uh, I think it was October 4th, everything was gone. So okay. I'm not quite sure. And when did you receive the uh, the uh, notice of violation? On the, when did we receive it? On the 20th, I think, of September. 20th of September. And you said that he was already gone after, before that? He was, he moved out in July, July 20, 20th, 19th or 20th. It was either Friday or Saturday late early morning he okay. moved um, left two cars behind one was going to be put together and that's what they came back to do okay now, now I'm showing that notice of violation took place June 11th is that more accurate or is there a different one or that's not the one we were we were cited on the 19th uh, 20th of September okay. 
Well, I'll let the uh, board ask any questions that they'd like to ask. Can you run through the dates again? I'm not really positive on all the dates. I do know when my nephew moved out. I don't know when the code officer was at the house. I don't know the dates on those. So the vehicles in question are your nephew's vehicles? Yes. Okay. And he left them behind when he left sometime in, looks like July or yes, July, July 19th or 20th? Yeah. And you got the notice of violation when, as best you can recall? September 20th. Okay. They had come back for a family wedding um, on like the 10th of September and were gone by um, the 4th of October. They were gone before the 4th, I think. Yeah, the, the, what's confusing, ma'am, is the paperwork we have says June 11, 13, it was uh, delivered uh, by postal carrier uh, to Jeffrey Shaw, and it was certified mail. <coughs> so is there a possibility we're missing something on the date issue? Uh, or is this a different violation that you're talking about? It's probably all the same. They probably gave us notice, but I'm not quite positive on which one you're talking about. one I have is September 20th. Okay. Well, when we do this, let's have uh, Mr. Rainsborough get up and explain the circumstances the town is looking at, and we'll, we'll go from there, okay? So you can make yourself comfortable. We'll probably be calling you up in a minute or two. Thanks. I'm Brian Longstaff. I'm the uh, zoning administrator for the town of Scarborough. This is Tom Rainsborough. He's our chief code enforcement officer for the town of Scarborough. Um, to answer your question or your confusion over the uh, notices of violation, there were two notices of violation issued, one in June and one in September. So if you file through your packet uh, under the, the packet that has the heading C, that's the, that's the second notice of violation. That's the September 20th notice, and that's the one that Mrs. Shaw is appealing. Okay, so she's appealing the second notice, not the first? Yeah. Okay. So it's really briefly, this this um, whole case started back in October uh, of uh, 2012, and maybe a little bit before then. Uh, Tom Rainsborough will um, fill you in on any prior activities. But this this started in October 2012, and in your packet, the first uh, exhibit that I gave you was A, and that was the, uh, an early letter uh, dated February 20, uh, 2013, to Mr. and Mrs. Shaw from. Sergeant John um, O'Malley of the Scarborough um, Police Department, and it kind of, it, it, you can read through it. it, it basically cites that there was noise violations. They answered more than 15 complaints at the house between October and February. Moving on to Exhibit B, that was uh, the first notice of violation dated June 11. Um, you can see the violations that we cited them for. You can see the return receipt for, the, for that notice. Um, there's also an email from John O'Malley to Tom Rainsboro um, mentioning um, more complaints at the residence and also I've included the evidence that the police department had gathered over that time um, showing phone numbers that led back to um, the nephew, Mr. Matthew, that uh, was staying with uh, the Shaws at that time and all of the listings on Craigslist uh, where he was selling parts um, and, and or vehicles. And there are photos at the back of that packet that show the conditions at the, at the residence at that time. Several vehicles in the yard, um, some dismantled, <coughs> cars up on blocks uh, or jacks, and um, parts stored outside. Um, at the garage. Then the third packet that I gave you was uh, labeled Exhibit C. That was the second notice of violation um, in September 20th, and I'll, I'll back up just a second. After the first notice was issued, that's when, as Mrs. Shaw, I think, uh, indicated, a few um, relocated for a period of time, and the activity seemed to cease. The complaints stopped coming uh, to the, to the uh, Code Enforcement Office for a few weeks. Um, and then they started up again, I think, in sometime in mid-August <clears throat> or late August. And so we started to collect evidence again. So we go to Exhibit C, and you can see 
the emails that uh, took place between our department and Sergeant O'Malley. Um, you can see a report from Jamie Higgins, Police Department, um, uh, of the conditions that he cited uh, on or around September 16th. Um, we also have in that packet a Craigslist um, ad for an Audi S4 in Falmouth. You'll note that the, uh, the phone numbers at the bottom of, the, of that ad, 207, with 415 spelled out, 4405, that's a tactic that is often used to um, prevent somebody from tracing that number back to um, an individual. The, in, the ad is for uh, uh, an Audi S4. Then you can see the pictures of the Audi S4 uh, posted on Craigslist or Instagram. I'm not sure which which vehicle that was that the uh, gentleman was using at that time. The photos that you see were were. Uh, off uh, either Craigslist or, Insta or uh, excuse me, Facebook or Insta Instagram, and then the final page that I provided you just to give you a date was uh, 9/18, uh, 2013. A photo of uh, some still some parts uh, outside the garage. We have additional photos in the file, um, which I'm happy to hand out. If you want to those up, just let me look at those. We need to have those back for the file. I'd also Thank submit you. that we're, we're actually submitting this entire file as, as evidence in case, because there's lots of different information in here I didn't provide you in your packets. Um, if there's any doubt or if you have any questions and you wish to review more information, the whole file is here for inspection. The final exhibit that I gave you is labeled D, and that was simply Mrs. Uh, Shaw's um, in, informing us, her, her letter informing us that she did intend to appeal this notice. Um, and so that gives you kind of the chronological date um, of how things occurred. We were back to the site several times, um, and again, as I say, prior to the final notice of violation. We did inspect the site uh, from the windshield this week. Uh, there are none of those signs currently at the site. However, at the time we issued the notice, um, that those were the conditions. We saw vehicles, we saw parts. Uh, there was activity going on, and there were complaints coming into the office. <coughs> Quick clarification. On the pictures, there's a date, 9-18-2013. Is that the date that was developed, the date that was taken? It was taken. So those are the dates that were taken. Exactly. And who took those pictures? Tom. You took those pictures. You certified those are the pictures you took inside the garage also? Yes. Yeah. Why don't I open this up to the public? Does anybody from the public wish to speak on this issue? I've seen none. I'll close the public section. Um, why don't we have, Mr. Shaw, why don't we have you get up again if you'd like? Maybe we can ask you some questions and maybe you can help clarify some of the, the inconsistencies. So would that be helpful? Okay. Now, have you seen these pictures that uh, have just been brought forward to us? They're pictures of the upper garage? Probably not the ones that you just got handed, but. Okay. Why, why don't you come forward and we'll let you take a look at them? Give you a second to get a feel of it. No, I have not seen Yeah, these were taken off by to the moving out. The first. Uh, continue just through the pictures, and, and, you know, and we'll talk about them as we go along. I just want you to see them all before we discuss them, as we, otherwise you won't know what we're talking about. And you'll notice the date on those is 9-9-17-2013, and then I asked Mr. Rainsborough if, if he'd certified that that, in fact, was the date that he took those pictures yeah. and that he took them personally, and he said he did. Um, the confusing <coughs> part, which gets back on microphone if you wouldn't mind. So the confusing part is you had said in July, right, that most of this uh, was already been taken out. Your, your nephew had gone. On July 20th, yes. Okay. And, but these pictures are from uh, September. Actually I'm sorry. Could you take the microphone, sir? Just, you can't, we can't hear you. It has to be on the record. He was, he was on the, in the process of cleaning up what he had left behind. Yeah. Okay. That, that actually 
Could you say your name again? I know it's Mr. Stroh who you are, but we need it on the record. I, I'm sorry. Um, I apologize. No but problem. Would anyway, know. the irony in all of this is that he came back with the intention of cleaning up because we still had a couple of cars in the yard and some of our parts left over from his first trip there. So he, um, the yellow car, for instance, it was supposed to be taken, 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 and it wasn't taken. So it wasn't even addressed until he came back and he was there to kind of push forward that this was needed. And, you know, and um, the black car was actually, they moved it into the garage because they were going to use that to take him back to Florida. Um, so the, and the blue car was just a shell. It was never anything but a shell. And that was also, and there were parts in the garage um, and I'm sure Tom will back me up on this. There were lots of pots still in the garage that needed to be removed. Um, the cars in, uh, pots that ended up on the yard were ended up on the yard because those pots, they needed to get some room in the, car, the garage to start working on the car that was going to take them back to Florida. Okay. Um, so basically, you know, it wasn't starting up again. They were cleaning up. Okay. Uh, board members, any questions for either the applicants or? You got your first notice in February, I think it was, if I'm correct. I'm sorry, what was that? The please? first notice of violation was February or something along those lines yeah. in, in 2013. Um, the first notice yeah. from Tom, yeah, I believe that's correct. How would you describe the information that came in that notice? What did they tell you? Did they tell you what you were in violation of? Did they tell you why you were in violation and the effect of being in violation? Did, what kind of information did they give you? Um, they, they, they basically told us, um, you know, that yes, we were in violation, and they, they, um, they gave us some frameworks with which to work, and you know, it was um, that we could have two cars here, and we could have, you know, working on one, and actually at the point that the citation was cited. To the best of our knowledge, we were in complete compliance with what they had told us at that particular time. Was it in writing or was it all verbal? It was verbal. Okay. So they told you, I just want to clarify it. So they told you, excuse me for jumping in. Sure, sure. They told you that you could do some more automotive repairs for people inside your garage? Yes. Not for people. Not for people, people but. The people who live there. Yes, and all these cars were people that lived there. They owned those cars. Yeah. What about all the sales, all the items that were up for sale uh, on Craigslist and everything else? You know, the only thing I know about Craigslist, to be honest with you, is that Craigslist is some site that a serial killer used to find victims. You know, I can't really tell you too much about it. Uh, you know? I have the same problem. No worries. <laughs> but, the, you know, the, the challenge is it appears that, that your nephew did know a lot about Craigslist. Uh, and he, here's... Just to maybe get to the chase, what I see when I look at this is a fairly sophisticated kid, how old he is, doing a business out of your garage selling parts on the web. Well, you and know, to be honest with you, you know, one of the things is I, I would imagine that there are lots of people doing business from inside their house, whether it's in the garage or not, and I'm sure one of the complaints complainants are is doing exactly that, working from their house. Yeah, I, I don't know about that. We need to keep on this issue here, but I, what I'm getting at is there's a lot. We need something compelling to say uh, other than we're cleaning up from the violation that was done in June, because realistically, at June's point, well, you it know, would, would have been expected to have been stopped. The, the one thing well, I, I was... I think when he came back, he just thought that he would cut his losses and, and get rid of it. Yeah. Now yeah, that's that's kind of a, the problem is it does violate the rule, and, th and that's what I see personally here. Um, but he didn't sell any of the stuff because he packed it all up and took it with him. Well, the problem he is took a loss. He took a loss on a lot of that stuff. Those pictures that are, we showed you show an awful lot of property. He has a motor outside of. <coughs> right. Uh, other board
Board member questions, comments, or is my attorney this afternoon? Any comments? I, I have just one. Um, you said the people that were living there. I thought it was just your nephew. How, how many people were living there? My nephew and a friend. A friend, a friend of my his his. <clears throat> the last uh, picture in that package, I just put that has a picture of ID license of the guy who was living there. Yeah, the black car was owned by the, uh, the person who was staying with us. Other comments from the board? Or the council? Yeah, I got a few more questions. Uh, the <clears throat> second notice of violation. Can you explain how that was delivered, what information they delivered, what violations they said you were uh, in violation of, and how did they handle it? That's when they came in. The second violation, um, that was certified mail, wasn't it? Yeah. Okay, yeah, it was certified mail. And you received it? Yes, we did. Okay. And we, you know, as I said, about that time, that's when he shut down his operation. You know, he, he, he started moving a lot of the stuff off the yard, you know, getting as much of it moved someplace else. He also, you know, ended up leaving the state until the wedding. You know, in other words, he realized that, no, he could not do this here. So, you know, it. it he wasn't going to be allowed. So. And what actions did you take between those two points to correct what was going on? Uh, well, as I said, you know, he, 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 was, he cleaned up as much at that time as he could, and when he came back from the, for the wedding, it was his intent to clean up the rest of it, what hadn't been cleaned up before. If you had to estimate the volume that was cleaned up between violation one and violation two, well, I, I would say all the stuff that was on the yard was removed from the yard. Um, <coughs> when the car was uh, stored in the in the garage, there were a couple of engines there, and one car was stored outside. So that was where we were after the first violation. But loose parts were pretty much out of the yard, or the they were? The parts were pretty much out of the yard, yes. And what date was that again, I'm sorry? And do you remember the date that took place? No, I do. Mr. Ainsworth, do you remember the date that you did? Did you go in and say at some point it was complete and everything was cleaned up, or is it still outstanding? I believe right after the. Uh, uh, what was the early notice date? The early notice was <laughs> June 13th, or June 13th. Yeah, first violation, June 11th, first right. violation, so, second so after, violation, September. So after the June 11th, uh, we went back to the site, met with Mr. Shar and, and everything like that. Uh, things, had, things had been uh, cleaned up, moved off site. He had run, they told me that he'd run the storage facility someplace, taken all the parts, and, and everything from outside, you know, the motors, the racks, the frames, and, uh, you know, uh, most everything was gone. Uh, at that point there, uh, they had started some repairs on the building and everything. So uh, at that point, he pretty much packed up, moved it all off to a storage facility. Um, they still retained a couple of cars on site, which is their right, uh, and stuff, for the unregistered vehicles and stuff. But he was supposed to discontinue all his work there. Um, so. And then when we came back on... Uh, I think the photos indicate that it, I was there on the 18th. Correct. And, uh, and and that happened to be a night that I worked late, so I swung by on my way home about it was after seven, I think. And so then I came back, uh, got Sergeant O'Malley to go over with me, and we we went and met Mr. Shaw and uh, the other gentleman in the photos there. Uh, they were take they had taken a couple of engines out of the vehicles there. They were uh, and actually these, you know, there was. All during this, so we're probably talking about a multiple of 
maybe 15 to 18 plus cars over the period of the last couple of years. You know, it was it was more than just a hobby. You know, they're very clever young guys, and I had encouraged them to go and you know get into business. And you know, I think they can do very well. They're very clever. And uh, but at that night, uh, you know, there was never any opportunity for anyone to present any titles or anything. They were the way they were buying the cars. They were just buying them on Craigslist or something to bring them there. Uh, they either pot them out or just shoot them through, you know, and retitle them or whatever they were doing. I, I have no evidence or, or no positive feel for that. Uh, my feelings there for that, but no positive evidence uh, that they were re doing it and everything. But it indicates to me like it was a recycling business and uh, uh, stuff. Uh, certainly the night was there that we took the photos of Mrs. Shaw. Uh, she claimed that one of the cars was hers and the other car was the other gentleman in the picture there. And, uh, you know, there was they would just had to take the engine out because they had to fix it a little bit or something, and they were going to put it back in. And you can clearly see that the blue car is, uh, you know, that that was an underwater salvage or something. So it was, uh, you know, it was clearly a parts car or something. The, the one they said they were pulling the engine out and putting it back in, did they say what they were doing with it? Uh, they were going to be for their personal transportation. That was the, uh, the it was their personal car, their, their ride car. And, and so it was always, well, I'm fixing that up for my cousin. I'm fixing that up for my friend. I'm doing this for my... So, they, so it was a constantly a turnover of cars that were for friends and everything like that. It was just a hobby and stuff. So, uh, But, the, you know, the listings on Craigslist, uh, uh, you know, talking to... Uh, I can't think of the name of the, your nephew. Oh, Joe. Talking to Joe... Joe said, well, geez, I had the same problem with, this, with the, or, um, the Orono code officer. He said he didn't, he didn't like me doing this either. So, uh, you know, it's clearly been a, a hobby of his for quite a long period of time, but uh, it's certainly um, for something that he was, if it was his hobby, he was subsidizing it by uh, the sale of the parts and in the cars. But clearly, you know, when you just car after car after car, uh, it's more than a hobby. Do we have a date of the final? Have you, has this case been closed out yet, or is it still racking up fees? Or no, they're here to appeal the decision. Uh, uh, they're, they're here to appeal our decision of the latest uh, violation notice. But as far as the, the was it the 24th? I guess is when it was served. From the 24th, do we have a, a, an end date where they've met, or ha are they still in violation? Uh, they're still in violation. They're they're appealing a decision to you as a board to see if we interpreted the rules correctly. Okay. Well, let's say for the sake of discussion, when we come back and do agree with the, with the your decision, what is the end date? At what point do we? Right now, the way this reads, they're if they are not in violation. I mean, if they are in violation, they're accruing fees of so much per day uh, until at some point that. They've cleared up that problem. Right. Have we established that date yet? No, that hasn't been established yet because it's still on appeal. Okay. Do we have any idea of what we're using for a benchmark for that at this point? Uh, I'll uh, sort of opine for a second. So there's no, I don't know of any, what, what the code office would do because it's been an appeal, everything's been sort of stopped. Okay, so, right. that's so but they would go out and determine. It sounds like you know maybe it's not even in violation anymore. Maybe it is, but the code office would go find out if it is in violation um, after tonight, depending on how it goes. Um, the appeal goes tonight. So if we um, hold, if we uphold the the position of the of the uh, code enforcement officer, what are they going to use for the end date for the per day penalty? They would determine that after. Uh, they would have to go out and make an independent judgment. It may be even before this hearing if there was proof given to them. Um, that you know everything was cleaned up by a date certain, but so while it's been an appeal, right? Uh, that code that, that has not made. been decided. Okay. Yeah, and and, no, and and that's not what we're asking you to do. We're just right. asking you to decide whether I interpreted the rules correctly or did not. You know, and and uh, you know if if you're going to uphold the Shaw's decision, uh, or you're going to hold uphold mine, that's all. So, so you have no other evidence as of September 18th. That was the last time you've been to the property and seen violations that have been documented. Right. Okay. Yep. Thank you.
and, and the disposition of the of the June uh, notice uh, that they were in compliance that they at, at when you came back so so that was dropped. Is that they had correct? Satis they had satisfied us on that notice of violation. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we, we, we had come to a conclusion and, uh, on that notice of violation. We were satisfied with the result, everything like that, and then when it started up again, see, the new violation was noticed. Okay. Um, any other questions for the board? The, uh, oh, yes, sir. Yeah, I'll just help to clarify that right now. What you're being asked to do tonight is just to, clar just to decide whether the code office was in error when they made their decision, not whether there should be fines, whether it should be prosecuted or any of that. That's a that's a sort of step two, if you will. If you notice that uh, the, after the first violation, for example, there were no fines and there were no uh, fines accrued and it wasn't brought as an enforcement action, that's a decision that will be made independently after. So it, 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 that hasn't been made. All you're looking at tonight is when the code office sent the letter, the notice of violation, was he in error based on the information he had? Um, and this and is on the second two, violation? On the second violation, that's what's a, what was appealed. Um, it doesn't mean that you're deciding that there's fines uh, or anything like that. Under your ordinance, the town manager gets to decide whether to bring this to court for an enforcement action or not. So that will be part of a different discussion. Okay. Thank you. All right. Any other questions, comments? No. Okay. Uh, I'll make a motion to uphold the uh, decision of the Town enforcement, town court enforcement officers, uh, <coughs> as described in the jewel, uh, September fourth, fourth, September sixth, the twentieth, September twentieth, notice of yeah. violation. I'll second that. Any discussion on the motion. Yeah, I think we ought to go on record as to what I, why, how we came to our yeah. opinions. Yeah. I seconded. Uh, Art, I did. Yeah, it's not a good idea. That's a good idea. All right, do you want to start with your position? Yeah, I, I think with what was presented, um, it, it kind of upholds the decision of the code enforcement officer. Um, while the appellant's um, nephew was in and out, there were still going on um, to uphold the, the decision. I think the evidence that was <coughs> that was stated by the, the town showed that the uh, people that have, of the Shaws that have appealed were clearly in violation at that time. So I think the evidence shows that uh, that there was still activity going on at the home. Yeah, I, I feel that the uh, code enforcement was really rather restrained in their response uh, and gave the uh, guys with over, over 15 calls, it seems that they gave the appellants more than ample time to have this, uh, this resolved. Um, uh, first of all, I think that you've been wronged by your nephew. Uh, whether you knew it or not, I think you, uh, you abused your courtesy. And the reason I say that is because he acted knowingly about what he was doing, both apparently in Orono and in Scarborough in the numerous complaints. And even after, uh, in September, uh, there are ads still running, and when you look at the three uh, pieces of fenders in the ba backyard and a car up in the air. At some point, you lose the luxury of uh, uh, it just was a coincidence or it just <coughs> kind of happened. It, the, the preponderance of evidence is just overwhelming that he has been abusing your, you know, and, and I'll be just as blunt as that. But and the problem is it's your property and it's your responsibility. And uh, at the end of the day, when you look at, uh, he had a business going in there. And so I have to, there's no, nothing that would allow me to be able to find any reason to, to overturn the decision. So with that, uh, the findings of fact and the conclusions, uh, this case is closed. Okay. Sorry, it wasn't a better answer. You should, um, we should, you, why, you should have a vote yeah, to give your reasons, vote. but you should actually vote, vote on the motion. All in favor of that motion. Unanimous. Yeah, Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. I appreciate yeah. your help.
right here. Appeals, appeal number 2505, it's a uh, limited, read actually 2503 and 2504, just so you know, has been asked by Mr. Bailey to postpone that to the next meeting, so please make a note that those have been requested by the FLM to uh, Which one was that? table, 20, uh, 2503 and 2504. Thank you. The next appeal is appeal number 2505. It's the limited reduction of yard size appeal by Thomas and Karen Sullivan, owners of property at 22 Pond View Drive, assessor's map R22, parcel 23B. To construct a two-car garage 32 feet from the front property line in the R2 zone. And I just need to state for the record that uh, uh, <laughs> Mr. Hatem is actually one of my attorneys. And so whether or not the board feels it might be a, a conflict of interest, uh, these cases don't have anything to do with me, uh, but uh, I work with a lot of attorneys, and he is one of the ones that I work with. I just want that to be on the record. Anybody have any concern with that? I'm okay with the chair. I'm with that. Uh, I also I work uh, with Peter on the Chamber of Commerce here in Scarborough. But I don't see that affecting this decision. Okay. Uh, so basically, it just to, to a affirmative position on it, can I have a motion to allow me to continue on this issue? As, re as a member. I'll make a motion. Second. All in favor? That's unanimous. And I'd like a motion for Mr. Tillman to be able to stay on this as uh, part of voting. Again, I'll make a motion. Second. All in favor? Okay, great. Thank you. Now let's come back to the appeal. All right. Mr. Hatem, how are you? Good. How are you? Uh, right. For the record, my name is Attorney Peter Hatem, and I'm representing uh, Thomas and Karen Sullivan of 22 Pond View Drive in Scarborough. Um, the Sullivans are looking to put a uh, two-car garage on their property at 22 Pond View Drive. Presently, they don't, they don't have one at all. Uh, most of the houses on the street do have them, although most of them were constructed without them initially. Uh, the request is to reduce the required front yard setback from 40 to 32 feet, uh, which is within the no more than 10 feet allowed by the ordinance. Uh, to start, what I'd like to note is, and, and, and point out to the board is Part of the reason, in fact, most of the reason we're here is because Pondview Drive is a four-rod road. It's not the town standard 50-foot uh, road. It's actually a 66-foot road. So it's actually the roadway itself is too big. So when you measure the setbacks from the uh, uh, edge of the roadway, edge of the right-of-way, um, that's why we're, we have a situation where putting, putting the, the garage where it normally would be within uh, the allowed setbacks is actually too close to the road. Uh, I did speak with the town uh, initially about uh, possibly discontinuing the eight-foot section on each side of the road because, uh, frankly, it's kind of overkill, but that was uh, uh, met with a, a negative feedback, so we decided to go uh, with this uh, request. Uh, in addition to the fact that the road is wider than the usual town road, uh, even though it only serves 22 homes and is a, a, a dead-end road, is um, because the leach the leach field that's in front of these these uh, the Sullivan's home is uh, 20 feet from the edge of where they want to put the garage. So in order to comply with the leach bed setback requirements and uh, uh, the ideal place to put the garage in the front of the house, close enough to the road to make this economical, uh, is within the eight feet that is only a problem because we have a wider than usual town road. Um, I, I've cited in my uh, submission the zoning ordinance sections, uh, uh, section 5, D5, uh, uh, 1 through 5, the uh, requirements for a limited reduction of yard size. Um, and uh, and I, I won't recite them again here. I'll just submit them as part of the record. Um, what we're looking to build is a simple uh, truss attic roof with a standard uh, 612 pitch, 8 foot walls. Uh, Pete Monahan has been in Scarborough building for over 25 years, and he's done dozens and dozens of these. We're looking to make the side of the garage that they're constructing match the existing house uh, to aesthetically blend the clapboard that's there already. I'm sorry, yellow cedar clapboard. And um, it's going to be constructed on a four-foot four frost wall with experienced excavators and a foundation subcontractor. Um, 
what we'd like to do is the board to grant this appeal and allow the uh, solvents to construct the two-car garage. Thank you, Mr. Hayden. Um, we have one letter. Uh, read it into the record. Uh, this is from uh, uh, Frederick Esty. Uh, Brian Longstaff, Sony Administrator. I'm writing in regards to my neighbors, Thomas and Karen Sullivan, request for a reduction of front setback for the purpose of building a garage. I'm the next door neighbor, 26 Pond View Drive, who will lose some of my view of the pond across the street when the project is completed. I would like to go on the record to say I hope the town approves their request and certainly have no problems with this. Thank you, Frederick Esty. A strange letter. <laughs> <laughs> um, any uh, phone calls? No. Want to open the public? Anybody wish to speak to this on the public record? I'll close this part of the public meeting and come back to the board with questions, comments, or motions. What's the speed limit on this road? Uh, I honestly have no idea. It's a. Uh, I got gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> you. Is it thank you? Thirty-five. Thank you. The, the orientation of the garage is to the side, though it's not. It, it's to the front of the, to the front of the roadway, but there is still plenty of space to pull out because. We're not measuring from the, the measurement is from the center line of the existing road. It's not paved, obviously, the entire 66 feet. So there is quite a bit of room to pull out and actually pull in. You're not pulling out into the road. The 25 mile per hour answer worked to your advantage. So. That's fine. <laughs> um, is that the shed is? Uh, did I read that the shed is being replaced yes. or or re relocated? Relocated. Relocated on the on the into the envelope. Right. Okay. Um, I know it's not aligned with a hammerhead. Is there a reason for that, or just trying to be it as it looks like you have a hammerhead in your driveway? Oh, we're going to change. You need, you need to step up and just identify yourself. No, that's fine. You can come up. And oh. <laughs> just don't, don't, don't touch this because it's electrified. Okay. We love to have different people <laughs> speak. Okay. My name's Karen Sullivan. I live at 22 Palm View Drive. And I, first, I don't even know what we were just oh. saying. Yeah. Why, oh, why the driveway? The okay, we're we're gonna dig that part of the driveway up and make a new driveway from the new garage if we're allowed to do it. Okay. Okay. I just didn't know if there was a reason other no, that's, than that. That's gonna be grass. Okay. Hopefully. Great. Other questions from the board or motion? Where is it that the um, that the shed is going to be moved to? Um, maybe to where the driveway is now, or possibly the backyard. There's plenty of room for it somewhere else. So it will stick out further towards the road, or it's going to be back? Um, we haven't really decided yet, but I'd like to put it in the backyard. I, I guess it, I would recommend to you that you put it be further back than the garage if you don't want it closer to the road. Because right. No, it wouldn't be closer to the road. Okay. For sure. It'll be in the building envelope. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Good. Yeah. That's within the big setback. Oh, yeah. yeah. Which, which means, which is also echoes the board member's comment that it will be behind the garage. Good. Yeah, possibly behind the house. Even. Okay. Mr. Long, step in, Dad, in this room. Well, just to address that last point, even relocating the shed, they'd have a permit for that, and we'd be able to review the location that they choose, and it would have to be within the buildable envelope. So, and it also has to avoid the septic system uh, disposal field. So, right. we'll help them choose it proper location for that. For point of clarification, the 20 feet from a building for a septic tank uh, or a, a, a leach field, is that a requirement of the new codes? It's in the plumbing code. Yeah. Is, is that part of the new, the new codes it's of two years? It's been the code for years. Is it 20 feet from any It depends structure. on whether it's a full foundation or a slab. Oh, okay. The setback. Um, good. Any other questions, comments, or a motion? I'd like to make a motion to approve Appeal 2505 as presented. Second. Okay. Okay, second. Um, I guess it was a tie. So and uh, uh, any, any discussion on the motion? I think it's pretty well clear. I think it's pretty straightforward. Uh, Circumstance. All in favor? you got to go through this. So, oh, that's right. You know something? I'm jumping the gun on this. I'm sorry. You know, I don't know why I did that, but let's go through it. It meets the requirements, so that's why it seems so easy. Yeah, we'll just yeah. go through it. Uh, where did I go here? Where to go. There we go. Okay. 
uh, I'm going to say it, and I'll just walk through these with you if you don't sure. mind. Uh, the existing building was in existence prior to 1991. Correct. Uh, the requested reduction is reasonably necessary to permit the owner or the occupant of the property to use and enjoy the property in essentially the same manner as other similar properties are utilized in the zone. Yes. I'm assuming that's because it's reasonable to have a garage in Maine. And, and just for the record, there's, in my submission, there was a specific line by line uh, uh, factual recitation as to why each one of those standards is complied. You can either read that or I would offer that into the record. We'll go into the record. We typically put it on, on tape anyway, and I should have done that's that right. anyways. But uh, due to the physical features of the lot and the location of the existing structures on the lot, it would not be practical to construct the proposed expansion, enlargement, or new bit structure in conformance with the currently applicable yard size requirements. And I think we figured out because of the septic system okay. really kind of limits what they can do. Exactly. And, and fact, again, the, uh, the size of the roadway. Unusual. For the that's road. interesting. You said it was a four, yard, four rod? Four rod road, 66 feet. So a two rod road is what? 33. 33. 33. The more common one is a three rod road, which is 49 and a half, which is still a half a foot short of the town standard. Interesting. Yeah. Right. Uh, Let's see, the impact effects of the enlargement expansion of new building or structure on existing uses in the neighborhood will not be substantially different from or greater than the impacts and effects of a building or structure that conforms to the yard size requirements. And you have that. Uh, I'll read this in. Thank you. The impacts and effects of the garage will not increase the impact of the neighborhood. The building will remain in single family residence as all buildings in the neighborhood, along with modest two car garage, like those in many homes in the neighborhood. Five, the applicant has not commenced construction. And uh, nothing's been done and no permit's been issued. That's correct. This was flagged when they went okay. in. And we'll let the rest stand on the record. And again, I apologize for jumping the gun. Having read it earlier, it was one of the easier ones. So let's go back to the motion for uh, just read the motion. Motion to approve uh, appeal 2505 as presented. I'll second that. And all in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you very much. Thanks Thank for catching that. Thank you, Mr. Adam. Mr. Sullivan did a great job. <laughs> I wasn't that bad, was it? <laughs> the next appeal is appeal number 2506, it's a practical difficulty variance appeal by Nat uh, Zilka. Did I pronounce that properly? Yeah. Could I take your mi microphone? That would be big help. Uh, to Library Lane, such as map U19, parcel 44, to relocate existing dwelling one foot from Library Lane and one foot from Seal Rock Drive in the R2 zone. Uh, welcome. If you could state your name and address, we'll go from there. Uh, my name is Trevor Watson. I work for Eider Investments, and we're uh, working on behalf of Nat Silka. Okay. Uh, so, the, um, do you want me to just go through the nature of the variance? Why don't you give us an overview of what you're trying to accomplish, and then we'll uh, go from there. So the Zilkas would like to renovate the property, and uh, currently 15% uh, 15, uh, 15 does not exist on the property, and so they'd be limited uh, in what they can do to sort of modernize that portion of the property, uh, portion of the structure that's not on the property. So it doesn't make a lot of sense to you know, spend uh, a lot of money renovating 75% of your property and still uh, you know, modernizing 75% of your property and still leaving 15%. Uh, where you can just sort of do aesthetic renovations to it. So we're asking to uh, move the structure uh, plus or minus 12 feet to the south, roughly, uh, to give it a uh, to go from a, a negative 11 foot setback to a positive one foot setback on Seal Rock Drive, and then at Library Lane go from a uh, negative one foot setback to a positive one foot setback. Um, and just uh, full disclosure, we've sort of gotten into the budget aspect of it, and some recent events that have happened in uh, the com you know, in that community. The um, initially, this proposal was filled out to renovate the structure, and now that the numbers are coming back. Uh, the Zilkas would like the option to uh, uh, fully rebuild the structure to so that nothing would be grandfathered in. There'd be a um, everything would be modernized, life safety, all those things. So uh, um, I think what we're most interested in in the, in the variance would be the one-foot setbacks, sort of, if that, that's clear. Now just a clarification. So, so the plans that are in here 
All right. st it's still all relevant. The, 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 the house will, will, the footprint will be reduced. The location of the house will be uh, this location. The design of the house will be a very similar aesthetic. It's just that, you know, there, there's a staircase that's, you know, the really steep. Uh, the costs of, of renovating exceed the, the cost of new construction. And um, the, the only concern I have, and I, I think the board might, uh, I'll let them speak on this issue, but um, there's a difference between raising the building and building a new one and moving a building. Um, and it's unlikely that the board would approve a, a blind slate. Uh, and also, it's not fair to the, app, the neighbors. Sure. That if they don't know that you're building a three-story versus a two-story versus a one-story. Matter of fact, this only shows um, one story, I believe. And I know there's—I think it's a two-story home. Uh, but the drawings we show in the one. So I, I guess my concern would be—it's uh, not as easy as it, it appears. I, I, uh, Mr. Longstaff, do you want to weigh in on this? Or? Well, I actually disagree. <laughs> 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 I, again, there are. The constraints, uh, first off, the neighbors have the right to come in and inspect the, the record, but uh, we, they haven't been sent all the information that you have in the first place. So so they're not going to know one way or the other. They're either going to object to the setback or they're not, basically, um, because the house is going to get moved or rebuilt in that spot because the building envelope is just so constrained. There's no possible way that they can put the building anywhere else on that lot but what they're proposing. The, as far as the size, um, you know, you can place conditions on the approval as to the square footage or the footprint of the building remaining as proposed, regardless of whether it's new construction or relocated construction. So, so I think you can place safeguards on the condition should you decide to approve that will satisfy that need. Um, as to the height of the building, there, you know, I think they're going to propose a, a very similar building um, either way, and again, you can put restrictions on that or conditions on that as you see fit um, as far as building height <coughs> and, and how it is constructed. Um, it is rather um, unusual for an applicant to, to change horses in the middle of the stream, and that is your prerogative to decide whether or not you are comfortable with that. Um, I'm just simply highlighting how you may, might consider yeah. doing that should you feel that the setbacks are appropriate given the circumstances. And that's, I think, what Trevor is trying to em emphasize here is what they're really concerned about is if we were to locate, relocate a building or build a building, would those setbacks be acceptable to the board? Would they meet the, the letter of uh, the variance request and the criteria that you have to decide on? I, I would I would encourage the board to not get bogged down in the details because the codes, the building codes, are going to basically handle that. Obviously, you can place conditions. It's not going to be a three-story building. It's not going to be, you know, this and that. But also, the codes will back that up. So we don't have a full set of plans yet anyway. I think the issue is if they were to try to make that building more conforming by putting it on the lot, squeezing it in so to the lot so that it's meeting those setbacks, would that be acceptable in the board's eyes for any structure, but specifically a structure of the size of this one and the same footprint? May, may I add to that? Or Go ahead. Ahead. Okay. The, my issue with that statement is two of the questions that we have to decide on is two and four. Granting the variance will not produce an undesirable change in character to the neighborhood and will not have an unreasonable deter detrimental effect on fair market value. I can't tell that without seeing what the design is going to look like. Again, that's my opinion. And the other one is that there's no other feasible alternative is as a, as a viable is available to the applicant. I can't tell that either without a, without a design. So I feel like I'm limited in being able to answer those questions in the affirmative if I don't have that information. So I'm kind and of those are blind. valid points. Um, again, as far as the feasibility, the issue is relocating the structure to put a, a good foundation under it is kind of the same as, okay, if we tear it down, we build a foundation of the same size, the setbacks are still going to be the same request. Right. So as far as the feasibility, I think you can answer that one. I think it's a very good point on the other. Yeah, on character, I can't tell whether if it's one story, three stories, whether it's a gingerbread house, whether it's a modern design. I, I don't know if it matches the character of the neighborhood or not. Could we do an approval 
or the size contingent upon a review by us just on the building itself? I think that probably we could. I mean, I, again, I, I think it's. I think we probably. Uh, Bill, I, I kind of agree with Mr. Longstaff. I think on this one because it's. If this were a different set of circumstances, and they were. This is this is actually improving the location. It's putting it more in the middle of the lot, and it, it, from what I see, that gives it into its full building envelope. No, no it doesn't. <laughs> On the outside, other edges. It's no? still going to be outside the buildable envelope because the buildable envelope is a little sliver of ground that has currently has a uh, an accessory garage. Excuse me, if, you, if you go to page four, the, I did a little diagram showing that the existing footprint of the structure cannot fit inside the current legal building envelope. Okay, that's what that is. Okay. So I, I, I guess my point I guess my point is that I have no problem with the approval request. I don't think any of us probably have a problem with moving it onto the property. Um, is the only question the 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 one of uh, the design aesthetic? I would probably say the, the question for me is we typically allow these kind of things as long as the envelope stays the same size, or roughly the same size. I think it's really the buildings. Yep, right? it'll be reduced. It'll go from 13.3 to 13.1 percent coverage. So that's your plan is the 13.1 percent coverage. So yep. how that looks doesn't really bother me. Is it, is it two stories? Do you, do you it'll believe? be two stories. If you go to the last page, there's okay. there's a um, there's some photographs of the existing structure, and we're actually going to um, we, we need to make. I mean, I know, you know. I'm going on record, so it's my word here, but yeah. um, we need to maintain the aesthetic because... Uh, but you're not going to two and a half stories, you believe you're going to stay at two stories? No, no, we will not change the, the you know, short of plus or minus two feet because of ridge lines. Okay. We're not going to go to two and a half stories. We are going to, the, you can see in some of the photos here, uh, in the upper right, the east side, and in the lower left, the north side, there is sort of a daylight because of the grade. Uh, which is one of the restrictions of the lot. There is sort of a uh, availability of a daylight basement down there, and we are planning on uh, on putting some windows in there. But we're not going to dramatically. We're going to maintain the grade around the property, so we're not going to turn that. We're not going to turn that into you know three stories along the roadside. What you see is what is what will remain. And you know the the Zilkas have a guest house that we built uh, a few years back. And um, it, it needs to be in keeping with that. Uh, that guest house actually played off of this house, and and in sort of a weird, you know, wag the dog tail, whatever the saying is. <laughs> the, uh, the the main the primary residence is going to be playing off the guest house. And the finishes and trims <laughs> yep. being relatively absolutely intact. I mean, with yes. Okay. When was that guest house? Uh, I think it was 2008. We do have one letter. Uh, this is from uh, Jesse Abbott. Dear Mr. Longstaff, we are the abutter of Z Zilka property and we wish to support the appeal. Mr. Zilka has been a good neighbor and his effort to move his house back into his lot is commendable. It appears that the other bulk and space requirements have been met after a review of the application in your office today. Please allow Mr. Zilka to improve the nonconforming location of the existing house with documented additions and deletions. Thank you for consideration. Um, any good. phone calls or anything else? Let me open up the public. Anybody wish to speak to us in public? I'll close public hearing. Um, so as the board, I, back to our point at hand. Uh, May I add my thoughts? Yeah. Sure. Based on the little information you just gave us, I feel much more comfortable around the character. I mean, this does go on record. It, you know, it is yeah. part of the public record, so you're, you're going to be held to it, and I, I think you're going to follow it. So I, I'm comfortable with the question, Thank too, you. then. Thank you. Mr. Dillon, you have a comment on that? No, go through the requirements. Yeah, you could hear that. And you got a Mr. Abbott's tough, so don't don't mess around. <laughs> That's on record. <laughs> oh, he knows it. <laughs> He's a good guy. <laughs> okay, the need for the variance is due to the unique circumstances of the property and not to the general conditions in the neighborhood. So if you could do me a favor and just answer these as we go through, that'd be great. I I, um, I actually printed out a, the wrong. Um, it's kind of embarrassing. Printed out the wrong. 
do um, sheets. So maybe I'll just answer it off the cuff. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so I'm going to ask Want me to ask a question again? Yeah, I'm sorry. No problem. The need for the variance is due to the unique circumstance of the property and not to the general conditions in the neighborhood. That's correct. The, the, the lot has unique restrictions. It's got three front yard setbacks. Uh, it's a long and you know, skinny lot with a very small legal building envelope. Additionally, the terrain is such that there's really only one prominent location for a structure of this size to be built, and that is almost entirely outside of the, the front, the, the, the legal building envelope. Thank okay. you very much. And the granting of the variance will not produce an undesirable change in the character of the neighborhood and will not have an unreasonably detrimental effect on either the use or fair market value of the abutting properties. And this is something that you brought up to do. That's okay. correct. We're going we're gonna to be taking a, a non-conforming structure uh, that is, in, you know, in a in degree of non-conformity. I don't know if there is such a thing, but very non-conforming, and take the structure that currently exists off the property and and wholly place it back on the strap uh, uh, on the property. And additionally, we're going to further that lessening uh, by. Relocate. Currently, there are decks on all sides of the, of the house that, that are sort of wasteful, as a lot of them aren't used because they're so close to the road. And we're going to concentrate those decks back towards the central portion of the of the property. And the practical difficulty is not the result of an action taken by the applicant or prior owner. Uh, that's correct. And no other feasible alternatives available to the applicant except the variance. Uh, there are no other feasible uh, alternatives except for the variance. And the logic being it, it's off somebody's property. So it's off its property. It doesn't fit uh, the, the, the structure, which is, you know, a, a standard size for that area itself does not fit in, in the existing legal building envelope. So it's just, again, there's just further restrictions on this property. And the uh, granting of the variance will bring, uh, result in bringing the applicant's property more nearly into conformance with the surrounding properties. <laughs> That's correct. It'll be, we're, you know, we're, in, we're improving the nonconformity of this nature. Uh, and um, we're going to allow for more privacy, both for the homeowners and for the uh, neighbors. And the granting of variance will not have an unreasonably adver adverse effect on the natural environment? Uh, the granting of this variance will not have uh, an unreasonable adverse effect on the, uh, on, on the environment. Uh, it's going to conform to modern, uh, build all, you know, modern building codes, life safety issues, and sort of re reduced maintenance requirements. And you're not in the flood zone? Not in the flood zone. Not up there. Okay. Uh, back to the board for questions, comments, or a motion. When were you hoping to uh, build, demolish? This this project we're hoping to uh, start in September of uh, 2014. That's going to create a is that yeah. That's going to create a little bit of a problem. Isn't it a year? Can we have a year? Six six, six months. months. We, is there a continuance option? You can, you can, can come we, back. Can we apply? We can you can get the permit, but you have to actually have started the work prior to the six month period. Now, the definition of started the work is up to the code enforcement. Does design office. work count? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> it, you, it, it's kind of been a policy that foundation work would have to begin. And in your case, should the applicant choose to demolish, demolish and removal would be a beginning of the work. Okay. Now you can come back in six months and ask for an extension of the appeal, but there's no guarantee that that'll that'll be approved. It's it's um, by then you'll have your plans done, so that'll, that'll be positive. Um, but from, I don't see any reasons why it wouldn't. But okay. I mean, it might be a different board. Anything can happen. Sure, I understand that. I think that that's probably our best bet. I just just don't forget to come back because if it's, you don't want it to. Six months. Yeah, you don't want it to expire. Or six months. It's Prior to less than. Yeah. Correct. Okay. Okay. Great. And uh, make a motion. Sure. To uh, approve appeal 2506 as presented. Second. Discussion on the motion. Now, do we need to go on record for how we. No. Okay. So. All in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you very much. We'll Great, see you in six you. months or five months. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't start in July either.
next appeal is appeal number 2507. It's a variance appeal by Susan Naden, 17 Shipwreck Road, Sessions Map U1, parcel 77, to construct an additional 14 feet from the property line and 10 feet from the west side property line, the R4 zone. Thank Welcome. You. If you could state your name and address, we'll go from there. Thank you. Uh, my name is Susan Naden. Um, we have a cottage at 17 Shipwreck Road at Higgins Beach. And first of all, thank you all for serving on these boards. I know sometimes it's kind of a thankless job, but we appreciate it. Sometimes. <laughs> the town pays us well. It's okay. <laughs> for the record, we don't get paid. <laughs> Maybe you get a bonus if you attend every meeting. Maybe <laughs> <Great> not. <laughs> okay, so tell us what you're up to. Okay, this is, I hope you got my little packet. And I don't know whether all of you received that or not. Or all of us received it. All of you received it, okay. So um, you've all looked through it, I'm sure, done your homework? Yes, so you um, can kind of go through the, the, the Reader's Digest version. We have all had the package for about two weeks. Okay, all right. Um, I taught kindergarten first grade, so if I get a little teacher read. <laughs> but you've all done your homework, so you're all set. Um, so this is at 17 Shipwreck Road. Um, we would like to, it, this started out as a project in about 2010 when uh, we, my mother passed away in 2008 and so the property was handed down to me. Um, in 2010 after we started really evaluating the cottage itself, we knew that it needed some help. It had, was built in, 19, in 1948 and since then the um, cement post pillars have settled and the hearth and the chimney have settled and so it, it needs some help and so we were thinking well you know how do we go about this what's the best thing to do so as I thought about the project I came and talked with people here at the town and they said that probably DEP would be involved because we are right on the beach so I went to Bill Bullard at DEP and talked with him and so told him our plan and what we'd like to do and he said that before we started, we would have to have a survey done of the property. It would have to be an elevation and a boundary survey, which we had done. And uh, when we all completed all of that, um, he told us that we could do the project. He came and visited the site and said everything looks fine as far as DEP was concerned. So we could go ahead with planning. So at that point, I had um, some construction people come in for estimates and quotes and had a building mover come in. And um, they gave us quotes on what they thought it would cost to do it. So at that point, um, uh, on the telephone pole across the street, um, the surveyor, who was Steve Ross, I guess maybe some of you know him, uh, put a nail where the elevation would have to be and it was going to be 14 feet. So we have a nail across the street at 14 feet on that telephone pole. Um, because we are close to the ocean, we have to go with their rules and that's one of them. So it would have to, the cottage would have to be lifted to that height. And to make the improvements, apparently the, the rule is with Scarborough and, and or DEP, I don't know which, that you cannot do more than 50% of the value of the building in one year unless you make these other commitments for the project. So we have decided that that was what we like to do and looked at the neighbors and saw what they had done and thought in um, the fall of 2010, my cousin who lived at Three Shipwreck Road was diagnosed with cancer. She was very sick, so we decided we would stay as long as we could in our cottage, which is not winterized. So we stayed and helped her out um, and decided, you know, this is really good. We really should winterize or should work at um, improving the cottage so we could stay longer in the year. So this appeal is about um, wanting to first improve the cottage and then as we thought about it, we also would like to expand it. So, um, I, do you have any, any other? That's good for right now. Okay. Uh, Mr. Longstaff, anything to add on this? Uh, no, I think I've provided you with staff comments on this project. Um, I do not have coffee yet. It's been through several phases because of different information that we got. And yeah. when I started the project, 
Dave Brisk was here, so I was talking with Dave Brisk and Tom Rainsborough. Then Dave left, and there was a big gap in there, and people were trying to fill in for him, and I was given false information at one point, so that necessitated another survey. So we now have three different surveys. The first one, I was told uh, we did not need any particular lines as far as high tides or anything, so Steve Ross did that. <coughs> The second, sir, the second time I came in, I was told by someone who was covering between Dave Brisk and now Brian um, that I would have to have a line on the survey where the mean high water mark was and where it crossed our lot. Well, I got that information, and um, that showed that we were inland from the 75-foot required setback, so that wasn't going to affect this project. So I went ahead and had um, Hancock Lumber and their design team, and we were working together. So we had this plan, which I was ready to submit. And then the day that I was ready, no, no, a couple of weeks before I was going to submit it, I was running through, Brian had been hired by then, and I was running things by him, and he said, I don't think it's mean high water. I think it's highest annual tide, Mark. So at that point, Steve Ross did some recalc, some calculations and extrapolated from <coughs> figures and so then showed where the mean showed where the highest annual tide line goes through our cottage and that changed the plan completely. That meant that we were the, the line crossed through the cottage so we now have a 30% expansion limit at the front of the cottage which meant that we had to move the whole plan toward the road. I tried to keep it as skinny as possible to make the um, limited setback on the sideline, but that because it squishes it, it has to go toward the road. So that's why it did not no longer met the limited reduction of yard size on the road side. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, why don't I uh, go through and I'll read some, uh, there are some letters here and I'll open up public hearing in a minute. Uh, this is from uh, Priscilla Reisman. Uh, in response to appeal number, oh, I'm sorry, in response to appeal by Susan Aden, owner of the property at 17 Shipwreck Road, assesses map U1, parcel 77, to construct a 309 square foot addition 14 feet from the front property line and 10 feet from the west side property line in the R4 zone, I wish to notify the Board of Appeals that I have no objection to granting the variance. I am the owner of the property directly abutting the Navalins. Uh, property to the west at 15 Shipwreck Road and would be directly impacted by the proposed addition. So she's on, uh, if you're facing the ocean, she's on the right-hand side? If you're facing the ocean, she's on the right, yes. She's on the right-hand mm -hmm. side, okay. And the home is being moved over toward her? Yes. Mm -hmm. The next appeal... Uh, Actually, the addition is, the home is not being moved. DEP has told me that it has to stay on its same footprint. So you're staying in the same footprint, but you're coming back. You, are you the same, the, the, the existing cottage, this was in two parts. The okay. existing cottage has to stay on its same footprint, and the addition would be going toward her. Okay. And this is the next one is, um, dear Ms. Longstaff, this is from uh, Eric Smith. We're sending this message to you in response to the letter received regarding appeal number 2507, fifth appeal sent on uh, November 25th, 2013 from Carol M. Logan on our behalf. It references uh, the zoning appeal by Susan Naden of 17 Shipwreck Road at Higgins Beach. We are the owners of, one, uh, of 12 Shipwreck Road, uh, which is across the street from the property in question. We object to the zoning variance requested, partic uh, particularly the side setback variance. The reason is simple. Prior to purchasing our house in 2002, we checked into allowability of houses in front of us toward the beach to expand. This is extremely important to us. We were told that the houses would have to be built up but not out due to zoning laws. Since the primary reason for our purchase was the view and our understanding that our view could not be blocked in the future, we went forward with the purchase of the house. If you look at the zoning map or uh, visit Higgins Beach, you will notice the view from the front of our house includes, including inside the house, is directly between the house in question and the neighboring house on the right, looking from our house. If the variance was accepted, it would forever block our view of the beach for which we paid and continue to pay. The attached picture gives us perspective uh, from the front of the house as well. Although our house is a second home, we are there full time from June through the beginning of September and many other times during the year, along weekends, vacations, holidays, etc. It is also our intention at this time to retire at this house. We do not 
and have not rent, ever, ever rented our home. Again, allowing the variance would, would forever block the view of our property after being told it could never happen, and it would also reduce the resale value of our house. Please consider the economic and personal impacts uh, the variance of 17 Shipwreck uh, would have on us by increasing the footprint of their house. We are primary party uh, at, that is affected by the potential change. Please do not approve the variance. Sincerely, Eric and Lauren Smith, 12 Shipwreck Road. And why not open up the public? Anybody who's suspected this from the public? Okay, I'll close the public portion. Come back to the board. Uh, as far as some of the comments in the second letter, just for the record, uh, nobody's entitled to a right to a view. So um, that's not part of our equation here. Um, you can look at the whole, as an overall view, the issue based on the criteria that are required in the, in the variance. But uh, the truth is, I'm entitled to a view. Should I say something else, too? Yes, ma'am, feel okay. free. Um, also, we knew that this letter was coming because my husband teaches at Southern Maine Community College. He was teaching a course last night there, and uh, Eric Smith called him and said that there would be an email sent regarding the project. So um, the only thing I could think of was it was a view problem. So this morning, after the snowstorm, <laughs> I went over and took some pictures. Can I show you these? Sure. This might answer a few of these these are silly. <laughs> I don't know how to do this, but... Why don't you just give me hands me, and I'll just kind of okay. pass them down okay. the board. And they are labeled underneath, so... Okay, great. I think... <coughs> I think they Must be the school teacher in you. <laughs> 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 Sorry about that. Thank you. While they're looking at that picture, let me ask a couple of quick questions if you don't mind. Okay. Um, so the reason you're here with the variance appeal is because you're in a in a um, uh, show land zone, is that correct? One of the reasons it forces you into the That's variance appeal. So and so are you planning on raising the building and then starting new or are you moving the building? We can't move it. It has to be They're on the same footprint. But they are going to raise the building. Sorry, let me rephrase the question. <laughs> They're lifting the building. Right. As opposed to raising the building. Right. <laughs> okay. We are R A I F. -G, <laughs> okay. Building. Okay. So you're lifting the building, getting up approximately how many feet? It'd be about three feet higher than it is now. Three feet higher than it is now. And then in the process, what you want to do is you want to do that expansion uh, to the the, the, the right, uh, looking at the water to the right. That's it the will other be part. over the driveway, and that's one of the the restrictions of the DEP is that any new construction in our zone has to be over previously impervious surface. So that's why we can go over the driveway and the covered porch. So the porch, the porch that you see there on the first. Off. So I see the plan as it exists now. Um, <coughs> do we have the, the plan as proposed, other than this picture here? I think if you just flip, yeah, that's the one with the dots. Oh, yes, that's, these are the three different curves. Here's the one here. 
So this is why we're so limited. Um, in the green... Actually, they won't be able to hear you on the microphone. Oh, okay. So if you could do me a favor and just sort of uh, just point and... All right. We'll have your assistant kind of <laughs> point out Turn if it does it really well. I actually have a copy in here so I can see it. So in the green area there at the bottom, the green stripes, mm -hmm. that is the area that we would be allowed to build in the way Scarborough zoning is now. That would be permissible for Scarborough zoning. The Except for the 75 foot setback. Right. So it's right. not. Right. <laughs> okay. Um, then the brown dotted area is the area that the shoreland zoning has the 30% limit on. So we can only put 30% of our existing square footage in that area. That's why everything has to be moved back into the blue dotted area okay. toward the road. Then the orange uh, area there that is outlined is what the variance would cover. The variance would cover 14 feet from Shipwreck Road and 10 feet from the sideline. Okay, so you're currently 21 and a half feet, give or take, from the sideline. Am I reading that right? Where you're are actually, you now? You're asking for another 10 feet over? Yes. 11 feet for over. The, right, where the building is, right. And the new addition would be further from the road than our existing cottage is now. The existing cottage at the closest is 10.29 feet from the road, and it would be 14 for the addition. So the addition would set back from what is already existing there. Did you look at the option of squaring off the building? Right. That's the yeah. Squaring it off which way? On the right-hand upper corners, as opposed to jutting out. Um, you mean putting it closer to the road? Well, in essence, it would be closer to the road, but we're in a variance, so all, you know, that, that allows you a lot of options in this scenario. I'm just kind of curious why, why you chose to go out instead of back. Well, it would only go out 8.5 feet, other than the stairs and landings, and that 8.5 feet would be just about big enough to put in a table, a dining room table. So the... Let me kind of figure out the trigger here. Boy, can have, help me with this too. The trigger that's requiring you to do the variance is because you want the expansion, or is the trigger, the requirement being, is it being triggered because it's uninhabitable at this point? Is, the standards of a variance are pretty hard to meet, and they're, they're tough. They're designed to be tough. And so what I'm trying to get from you is, what's the motivating factor here, and and what's driving this. If this wasn't in a shoreland zone, my guess is you'd be coming for side setback, limited reduction. Of, uh, limited reduction. Right. Uh, so the, right. Real, the motive here is to actually expand the building and at the same time upgrade it. Right. Okay. But she could do that even if she wasn't. Limited reduction. Limited reduction, even in this room. Oh, what's the other one? Practical. Practical difficulty. I'm sorry. Um, well, why don't we go through the criteria? Also in your packet, I'm sure you saw the pictures of our cottage and neighbors' cottages. Those are in your packet, too. So it's not going to change the character of the neighborhood. If anything, it's going to upgrade it. This is a variance appeal. So I'm going to read in the first one, and then you can kind of help us walk through this, okay? Okay. Uh, the land in question cannot yield a reasonable return unless the variance is granted. And listen to that real carefully because it's important you understand it. The land in question cannot yield a reasonable return. The definition of that is actually in this book. Uh, it's not anymore. Yes, it used to be. Um, but it basically means that it actually has almost no value which would be triggered by if the building was ready to fall apart or it was, it was just really in tough shape or whatever and it, it just wasn't inhabitable. We tend to let that be enough of a reason to justify that. Um, but what, what is the, if we don't grant this variance, how do you answer that question in a way that we can say yes? 
I think the only option, if this variance were not granted, would be to go to 35 feet, probably, and uh, uh, builders have told me that we could not do that, 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 that the structure would not support three stories. So that was not an option. Okay. Uh, the need for the variance is due to the unique circumstances of the property and not to the general conditions of the neighborhood. I never really understood that question, to be honest. <laughs> It's because the property is limited. Right. <coughs> Where is it? Okay. The granting of the variance will not alter the essential character of the locality. That's for sure. If you look in here at the other cottages on the street, um, I have pictures of 15 Shipwreck, which is where you got your letter from. Um, over the years, people have modernized and changed and improved and everything, the cottages. Most of them are on foundations, which we are not allowed to do, and I think that's a smart thing. Um, most of them are on foundations with basements. We do not have that option. So everything for us, for utilities, must be inside the cottage, including hot water heaters and um, heating systems and plumbing and everything else must be inside the cottage. So we, we don't have underneath as, a, as an option for that. Um, so 15 shipwreck has, is on a foundation and is two stories. 19 shipwreck is on a foundation with two stories. Five shipwreck has been expanded out and up and has a foundation. Seven shipwreck is the same thing. Um, the Smiths, who you got the letter from, is number 12. It's a picture of their cottage here. They are um, on a foundation. They have, we've, I've, when I took the pictures, we were counting shingles today. And we figure probably that cottage is about 28 by 24, two stories, and then there's an addition on the back that's probably 14 by 10. So probably that's a 1,500 square foot um, house, which is quite a bit different than ours. Um, 14 shipwreck has on a foundation and it has a basement and is three stories. The one that's at 10 Shipwreck Road in your packet is, uh, it was currently under construction then when I took that picture, but it's now finished and the people have moved in. Two Shipwreck Road um, is, we call it the Shipwreck Hotel. It's so huge. Okay, that's good enough. That gives me a good feel. Uh, the, the, the hardship is not the result of an action taken by the ap uh, applicant or prior owner. Well, you didn't create the hardship. No. <laughs> um, so at this point, uh, when we come to the board, I'm sure they've got a lot of questions, and we'll go from there. Oh, another thing regarding the character of the neighborhood. We do have a picture in here, this one here, that shows the distance of the other houses from Shipwreck Road. And ours will be further back than most. Even though the addition will be 14 feet from the road line, that's further back than most of the others. Uh, board members? If you were to do nothing at this point, how does that affect the value of the property? Of Say our? between now and 20 years from now. Of our property? Yeah. Who's to say? Uh, I'm not sure. I I'm just say. asking your opinion. Yeah. I would think. I would think it would be certainly less because other ones around it are all improved. So if someone had a, a choice of buying ours, which is 20 by 20 essentially square feet cottage, um, versus some of the others, I'm sure those would sell first for what people are looking for in that area. But that's not why I'm doing it. <laughs> are there any safety issues with the with the current building? Um, are foundations sinking, uh, wiring issues, uh, that type? And that's all included here in the I fringe benefit. I understand that, but we need it on the record. Okay. Some of the fringe benefits that will come with this project are, I have substantial improvements will include a new DEP-approved engineered flow-through pier system, stabilizing and elevating the cottage to at least the currently recommended level, a safe exit from the second floor directly to outside, insulation to prevent heat escape and frozen pipes and drains, completely new electrical wiring and conversion to a 100-amp circuit breaker service, egress windows where necessary, a new chimney, rebuilt hearth and stove, 
changes to extend the use of the cottage further into the shoulder season and conserve energy and improve doorways downstairs. Those are just some of the things. Uh, the, the current mechanical system substandard to today's standards. What do you consider mechanical? Heating. Heating, we have a small Renai heater run on propane. Your electrical systems to code today? Uh, probably not. That's part of the improvement is to go to 100 amp service with a circuit breaker system. Structural foundation or, or you're on piers? We are on piers, which yeah. is right, which are deteriorating. Those have to be replaced. So, so if, if this were not approved, at the very minimum, you would still need to replace the piers and probably the wiring and several other things. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sorry, so we, we, could you get to state your name and uh, get on the microphone, that'd be great. Uh, again, we won't be able to hear you unless you're on the microphone. Sorry about that. Yeah, it would be our... There are issues with it. I mean, built in 1948, and we, I've, I've maintained it the best I can. But the, high, the wiring is still good, but it's the old original. And since it isn't insulated and well, we're replacing it. It's on, um, uh, as you said, having uh, fuses, uh, fuses uh, and that has to be fixed. The roof itself, as I mentioned, when they put the mortar in the chimney, they used the seawater. So now, so, so now the roof is deteriorating, and the water just and it's starting to build starting because it's food. So down the road, if we don't take care of these issues, we're not going to have any cottage at all. So, you know, and my wife wants to maintain a nice old cottage. We don't want it, we don't lose it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you know, we're not trying to, you know, make it any more. The road home, that's not what we're trying to do. Okay. But we do have to replace those things. We do have to fix them, for sure. Uh, board comments amongst yourselves, Mr. Uh, Monk staff, anything you want to add at all? Uh, no, only to reiterate that the part of the issue is that had it not been for the, the um, delineation of the highest annual tide line, she probably could have applied for just a limited reduction of yard size variance and met those criteria very easily. And it, just so I get this clarified, the, the reason that it kicks to the variance is because of the fact that that 75 foot had, had that pushed her expansion project back closer to the road, which then didn't meet the 10 foot reduction on the road side or the front side of the, the cottage as she had originally planned. So that, that's what triggered that. And if that was the case, uh, it would have gone for a limited reduction. It would have been eligible for a limited reduction. Suggestion for whatever it's worth. Mm -hmm. It's just on the board. Um, I don't think we meet A. The land in question cannot use re reasonable return unless the variance is granted, especially with a neighbor that has an issue. I don't think we can, I don't think it meets it. I would think we'd have a better chance pushing this through if you were building backwards toward the road and actually going closer to the road and matching up with more houses, I'd be more comfortable with that than I am with going off to the side. In other words, if I'm going to violate a, 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 a part of the property, I'd probably recommend violating toward the back or toward the front, toward the road, as opposed to coming off the side because it's going to have less impact on anybody around, I would imagine. And uh, I do not believe we can hit A. And with, with a neighbor that uh, has an issue with it, I think we have to be a little bit more cautious than if there's not a neighbor that has an issue. I, I would say that I probably uh, I 
totally understand the neighbor issue. However, I believe because there's a, an issue with the pilings and the building, uh, we don't know what all those buildings down in that area are like. The, the, the seawater and the winds and the, just the conditions down there deteriorate buildings extremely fast. And uh, without action on that building, it won't be long and there won't be much there. I'd have to agree with Jim. The, the condition of the house is deteriorating. And uh, by past that experience of that neighborhood and surrounding cottages and houses, they're all, or most of them, are updated. Yeah, but th this is going outside of the current footprint. And that doesn't, that's what's causing me the problem. If this is just being rebuilt, if they, if they came forward and said, we want to raise the building, knock it down, rebuild it in the same location, I can go, yeah, no problem, this is easy, no matter what a neighbor would say, because that's really, when you knock a building down, you've actually proven that it's got no value. Uh, so me to be that, that threshold can be met fairly easily, but now we're talking about an expansion along with that. And that's where I'm having my trouble passing cannot yield a reasonable return. So you would be okay with the same footprint if it went up? As, 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 uh, yeah, in past history, we've allowed it to go up. Right. Uh, that's been a pretty standard position of the board is going up is not a problem as long as you're staying in the footprint. Uh, in this case here, we're asking for it to go outside the footprint on a variance appeal. And I think Mr. Long, uh, staff is right. I mean, from a practical point of view, it really would fall under, if it wasn't for the 75 foot uh, setback, it would fall under uh, the limited reduction of yard size. Just for the public's knowledge, the requirements are built prior to 1991, which would be met. The requested reduction is reasonably necessary to permit the owner or occupant of the property to use and enjoy the property in essentially the same manner as other similar properties are situated in the zoning district. That's a call. Uh, due to the physical features of the lot or the location of existing structures on the lot, it would not be practical to construct the proposed expansion, enlargement, or new structure in conformance with the currently applicable yard size. And the impacts and effects of enlargement, expansion, or new building or structure or an existing use of the neighborhood will not be substantially different from or greater than the impacts and effects of the building or structure which conforms to the yard size requirements. And that applicant hasn't started. So the, the threshold. The sad reality is the threshold of a limited reduction is pretty easy, um, but a variance is not. And we've, that, that's my challenge. So if this appeal were to fail, could, couldn't they come back with that? They could come back with a couple of things. They could come back at, with it expanding off toward the road. That would that'd be a new, that would be an, essentially a new appeal. So they would be able to come back with, with another try at the right. a new design. Yeah. Uh, it, it may be that the home, uh, and we'll get to you in a second, but just we need to kind of walk through what our, where our heads, and by you hearing where our heads are, maybe it will help you help, help us come to an answer that works and still stay within the, the state's regulations. We try to be as reasonable as we can with these. Variance appeal is tough. It's just a tough appeal. And when somebody has a problem, it adds to that because we have to be able to defend our position. And so we can't just say, oh, we like her, she's nice, give it to her. Or her arguments make sense, that's good. We have to be able to justify it at the next level of a court if somebody decides to sue. And why did you say, how did you get an A? And what's, what's, your, what's your logic there? How do you defend that position? And that's a hard thing to sell. And that, that's my concern. If, if I can add to that, some of the information that we get as board members, uh, there's legal precedence that's been set in previous court cases and some of the stuff that we have, and this is on page 73 of the Zoning Board of Appeals uh, document that they give us, um, and it talks about reasonable return and how they come up with that standard and what that really means. And one case that, and, and this is going to be boring so I'm really sorry, but uh, let me get this right. In it's either in Bailey versus the city of South Portland or in Brooks versus Cumberland Farms. And so it's got to be Bailey versus South Portland. It says the typical, typical request for a setback variance to allow a deck, porch, garage, storage building, or an addition to an existing structure will have to be denied on the basis of the reasonable return standard, absent proof that the person has tried to sell the property as is, and no one will buy it unless the proposed construction can occur or that that property cannot be used for another legal purpose under the zone ordinance. So that legal precedence is out there. 
and and it also comes to state that you don't ha you should not be forced to sell your land to get a reasonable return. So there's a balance there. One one way says you can't you shouldn't have to sell. It. The other one says if you should try to sell it. So the difficult part from a person that's coming in with an appeal of this type is to prove to us that short of selling this property, I have no choice, and I will never get a reasonable return on that. And that's difficult to prove because really what you could do is say, well, I'll just upgrade the upgrade the condition of the mechanical systems and the structural structural components and leave it in the same envelope. You have every legal right to do that. And then we'd say, okay, it does pass that. But expanding the envelope of almost 11 feet to one side makes it difficult to really pass the straight face test from a board member standpoint to say, yeah, it does, it'll have a reasonable return if they do this. And that's really, it's difficult for us to say that in this case. I don't know if that makes sense or not or if it helps. It certainly doesn't make it feel any better. Right. Well, for practicality of the case, we're both 67 years old. We're trying to not get through the same. Right. I know that doesn't mean it's quite From a legal standpoint, that's it. I know. But that's I, that's, that's tough. That's exactly why we're trying to do it, and it was a very modest at all. And then the use out front for whatever, parking or whatever, more difficult if you do that. So something, as I said, has got to be done to it. It's right. coming down the front. Now, one of the things here, I don't know whether this will help or not, it says examples of reasonable return. One of them is conformance is possible only at great expense, and that would be going three stories because we would have to practically rebuild the whole cottage that's there because of the structure. It's not going to support that. Remember how I said that um, the view is not something that you have a right to yeah. about the, one of the letters? Well, the opposite of that is the size of your space is limited by what the regulations are, so there's, there's no right to that either. And so you can't, it, it's, that, it's that balancing act that you can't go one, one way with one thing and another with another. So we're trying to be consistent. I, I think you're sensing from the board, at least three of us at this point, that we have a challenge with um, the proposal as design. And I'll be candid. My issue is always the same, and, and uh, poor Mr. Longstaff has heard it too much already. He's only been here a few months. I, I want to know that when we prove something, we're not going to be in a situation that puts the town at risk for a lawsuit. And so when we get somebody saying they want to do something and nobody cares, I'll be honest. It makes it easier for us to make decisions. When somebody cares, it exposes the town. And would there be a lawsuit? I don't know. But what I do know is that what would be maybe able to give a little bit more room on the variance, like, for instance, I said I would argue that if you had to tear the building down and rebuild it, that meets that threshold to me. Well, it doesn't by some case law. I would argue that it does. And if it went to court, that would be an interesting debate. This debate here, expansion for the sake of expansion, is really, I don't think we can defend that position, and that's my concern. Um, as I've hinted, I mean, I would rather see you come back with a plan that goes out toward the road more and get a variance for that, because there's likely to be no complaints about that. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. That's not possible because that's not a paved surface where she can can't do it. Thank I think you. She already explained that. I missed it. Now, thank you very much. There we go. That's why he's in his role. Is so I can't even offer you that. Uh, I, I'm just stuck with this. Yeah. And, and the, the downside is if we take a vote and it gets voted down, then the project's dead for what a year. A year. And we don't want to do that. You can re, you can rebuild it as it sits, and you can remodel it as it sits, but you couldn't expand it for one year. You have to come back, and with a sub, it's described as a substantially different plan. That's there really is no other plan. There. If you look at the, if you look at your plot plan, there, there is no other place to go. That is, that is what it would be right there that meets the criteria of everybody. Board for comments, Mr. Longstaff. Do you have any opinions? Jump in, feel free. <laughs> As the applicants, are you willing to, to reach out to a different architect or a different design group to try and come up with another option for the property 
as it sits? I don't know where it would be. As you look at that plot plan, if you can come up with something, I'd love to hear it. Again, I'm not an expert in architecture, so I can't, I can't help you there. But there are some very innovative people in the Scarborough town area, and we've seen some them do some amazing things. So I understand. So I think maybe a silo or grain elevator. <laughs> And I guess for me, the, the, the cost part of it is uh, part of the reasonable return. Uh, I think if you didn't have to do any of the work to, to upgrade the, the cottage and to, to current standards, um, I would be in 100% agreement uh, with, with the other members here uh, because I, there's just certain things that you can't do. But because that triggers a need, I believe that a need to do upgrades to begin with then, then to make it cost effective so that you have a reasonable return on that. That's how I justify the reasonable re return part of that. Uh, by doing an expansion, it gives you more of a return on that on that investment that you've made there. So could I ask one question? Sure. So basically, we're saying here that one person that's across the street who has complained lives across the street because of all of the other issues that go along with this, even though you can't have a person say that it's a view thing, that is, that is triggering to really what you guys have to vote That's a great question. Uh, I'll talk only for me. Okay, I'm only speaking for me and how I try to rock, work through the issues when they come to me. A variance appeal is the hardest appeal to meet. It hardly ever is met. There are times when even though it's hard to meet, if there's no opposition or there's little challenge to it or it doesn't affect anybody, no one's going to care, and we live in a small town still. So the reality is that sometimes we can say, you know, I will vote yes to this, although I'm not really comfortable. Or I'll vote no if I'm not really comfortable. That's just me, and it's, it's a judgment call. When it's cut and dry, that it doesn't meet the threshold for me personally, and there's a potential issue, um, it, it takes that luxury away for me personally. I, I lose that option. And that's just me personally. It's how I make my decisions. Technically, we should be only following the rules right to the letter, exactly as it's written. And to be candid with you, this doesn't meet that requirement. It doesn't come close. So if I were going to use the definition as it's written, without any emotion in it, I would tell you it doesn't don't fill out the application, don't spend the money. But that being said, we try not to work that way. We've been lucky in, in this town to be able to have some flexibility. I don't know if that answers it or not. I don't know if it gives you the it's not there's no good answer from my point of view for you because I'm a no vote. And but I want you to know that it's not because I'm trying to be callous or anything else, but that's the logic uh from my heart where I'm at with it and why. I see that uh, along your lines, Mark, as a, uh, an abutter who sees things as Mark is seeing it right now. But if we pass it, he'll challenge it, or could challenge it, and it goes to case, and it comes right back. It goes to some lawyer or a judge to rule upon it, and then he throws it back to us for facts of finding and all that. I, I think it's very difficult I mean, my, I, I think it meets that reasonable return mark. Mark. <laughs> Sorry. Um, um, you raised it. But, but that's debatable. And the good news is all you need is three, three votes. Uh, three is yes. Three yes is, a, is an affirmative. Two is, a, is not. In my opinion, again, the, the question is around the land in question cannot yield a reasonable return unless the variance is granted. Um, I think without going out and reaching out to see if there are more viable options to work with what little envelope you have, it's difficult for me to answer that question A 
passing the straight face test saying yes. Because I think there are things that you could do with the property to improve upon its current condition. It may not change the size of the envelope, and that's what you're really reaching out to do, is tr to try and change the size of the envelope to more closely match the properties in the area. And, and I understand why you're trying to do that. This is going to be a retirement home, and you want to enjoy it. I think we would all want to do that. No, it's not going to be a retirement no. home. Or, or it's really not. It's just we want to make it usable for a portion of the year. That's okay. Really and our kids okay. love coming there. And now that we have a daughter-in-law, and they like to come. I mean, when the kids were young, our, our upstairs is essentially an attic, and that's where everybody slept. When the kids were young, it was like the Waltons. Good night, Mom. Good night, Jeremy. Good night, Jason. Good night, Dad. No, from bed to bed, not even separate rooms. Now the kids are getting married, and, you know, they'd like a separate room. <laughs> I wonder why. Yes. <laughs> so things have changed. Not just, not, it's not just that we're wishing we had that. There are conditions. Families are changing. You know, it's, I, I think the sad part is, that we could vote on. And there are very few places on Higgins Beach that are in the borders. And, and we don't want it. We want to keep it. We, we want to keep it with that charm. We're, we're not going to cheat rock it. We're not going to do all that kind of stuff. We just need some more space in the dining room and a place to maybe put a, a, a bigger stall. That's really all this little section is going to be. I understand and I appreciate all these things. But from our point of view, we're not, we're not asking for a home that we can live all winter in. Yeah. I have to blow the lines out with a compressor and stall underneath here when we go home back to Yarmouth. We're, we're stuck between a really rock and hard place. We just want a basic cottage that still looks like 1940, you know, and it is upgraded. And, and because I, as I said, in the next year, the force of Auckland is in the place right now. And I'm really concerned about that. Yeah. Uh, when you consider two by fours are starting to do this kind of thing, and that worries me a lot. So I, I don't know where we go. We have to fix that, and then you don't want to fix something that you're going to have to do something else to it. And as I said, getting the, my wife has done a terrific job. She's done her plan. She's going to do this, and she took time to do it, and it's worked extremely hard. And uh, and I know you appreciate that because you can see what she's done. That's very thorough. We we're just tough. We have a higher than architect is going to go. <laughs> I mean, really. I mean, it's very expensive. And that's not what we want. I mean, an architect is just maybe maybe do something with the third floor, but we know pretty much what we like to do, and we work with a contractor and the, the subcontractors, and I'm sure we could do it. But again, you guys do have to do what you have to do. Yeah. I very much empathize with what you're going through, and I would be trying to do the same thing if I were in that position. But I, st I still don't think I have enough information that I can answer that in an affirmative. So at this point, you have two choices. We can vote, or if you want to table it uh, to try and get some more information to help uh, meet Mr. Lizelle's needs, you're welcome to do that. If we vote, two uh, to two is a, means it doesn't carry. Mm -hmm. Three does. And if it fails, that's not the end of the story. You can wait a year and come back, or you can propose a different <coughs> plan, and we're pretty lenient on what a different plan might be, uh, and bring it back as, as soon as, not this following period, but the next, and, and have it reexamined by the board. And, Mr. Chair, may I add, if you came back another night and we had five members, then it's a three-to-two vote, and you get three and it's a win, rather than two-two tie and it's a loss. Mm -hmm. uh, how, would, how would you like to proceed at this point? Well, I certainly don't want a no vote, but I don't know what we're going to do. Yeah, I, I'm just at loss of how we're going to correct this without a follow down before, before we get back to you. That's all. I mean, are, are you going to be making any moves within the next month? Making what? Are you going to be making any moves within the next month? If we were to approve it tonight, would you start as soon as possible? Yeah. We, would, we would get a contractor, which we, we talk to, and start working with these people and get them better plans drawn up for professional plans. You did a great job with what you did on it, but getting it, yes, we would. The next, that's what we're waiting to do here. We're, we're Will another to month kill the project is, is really what I'm asking, because you may want to table it until next, I don't know if they can table it until next 
meeting or not. Yeah, I can't I choose. But I, I well, the, 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 one, the one issue that I think is going to be a tough one is how we get the footprint out through what is the present kitchen and the bathroom now, how you get what we need for facilities in that area. It would be completely foreign to what we have now. Yeah. And that's what I'm concerned about because I'm not sure how you can do that. <laughs> I just don't know what you can do. Ms. Swanson, can I ask a question on the, on the impervious surface? Mm -hmm. The way the Stroland Zone rules read, it can be on something that's already impervious surface, or could you replace it? In other words, if you took the impervious surface and moved it, would that meet the requirement, or it doesn't meet the requirement? It's not the Shoreland rules that that. Which Shoreland does that? deal with impervious surface, but what they're talking about is, is rules within the Dune, the Natural Resource Protection Act, within the uh, frontal dune. That's the Dune Act. It's the Dune that's requiring them to any any expansion has to occur on an already impervious surface. Is there any is there any um, um, precedent for moving that impervious surface? I words, can't answer that because I don't regulate that that code. That would have to be done through the state. So in other words, if they went to the state and said, "Look, what we like to do is rip this driveway up, and this actually makes it better if we put it toward the forward of the road." Would you would you work with us on that? My, my understanding is that that not an activity that they would probably likely suggest because they usually go for no disturbance, right? No additional disturbance where where it's not already impervious, there's no disturbance. Okay, that's what we've been told also. Okay. Well, um, again, I'll just ask you: Would you like us to table this or a vote? So the options are either vote or table, right? At this right. point. I would say table. Okay. Well, there's, there's a request to the table for more the reason why you'd be doing it. So you know, is for more information that you could bring forward to help sway the position. Now, I don't want to. My concern for you is I don't want to j mislead you into thinking that's that gets you anywhere. In other words, just coming back next month, you, the still the issues are still there unless you come up with more information that can help sway your argument towards how to meet that condition one. I think A is the only condition that anybody has a problem with. Is that fair? Correct. Everybody agree? So uh, getting kind of an overview of the board that says that we're only troubled with um, A, which is the minimum standard. And I'm, I've, vocal, I've vocally stated my position. Is everybody else, there's not three votes here, is there? Okay. So you're hearing that there aren't three votes. So there's no sense. The right thing to do is table at least to think about presenting something that's got more information to justify that position. But I don't want to bludgeon you with a false hope that that, that tabling is going to accomplish a lot. I just think it's a really high threshold. But adding another member might be enough to take you over the threshold. That's true. So are we 2-2 two, two at this point, pretty much? I, I would, I, I'll give you my opinion. I would be voting no right now if, if we were to take a vote. I would be voting yes. You'd yes. be voting yes? And I'd be voting yes. So, yeah, voting you get, yes. I, I would recommend you postpone. Okay, it won't hurt you. Mm -hmm. We'll bring it back when uh, it will be third on the agenda, I believe, next month. So do I have to reapply and all that kind of thing? Uh, just go in tomorrow or? and talk with uh, the office, and they'll kind of help you through with the, the process. Okay. Okay, you don't have to go through a whole bunch. but. Okay. Do we need all to right. make a motion on that? To yeah, I'd like to move the table as requested. The board, the, uh, the Seconded. All in favor? It's table. Thank you for your opinions. We'll see what we can do. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for your courtesy. I'm sorry that, uh, yes. to be so blunt. Five oh eight is a limited reduction of yard size by uh, King Line Sign, ninety six East Grand Avenue, assessors map U twenty three, parcel seventy six construct the third story, twelve point five feet from the side property line in R four A zone. And again, uh, the same issues with uh, Attorney Hatem. Uh, I'm assuming that the position stays the same in this issue. The board okay with that? Yes. 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 Mr. Hatem. Uh, for the record, Attorney Peter Hayden representing the uh, applicant, King Weinstein, owner of 96 uh, East Grand Avenue in Scarborough. 
Uh, this is a limited reduction of yard size appeal, uh, fairly straightforward. Um, Mr. Weinstein uh, is looking to put a, uh, as of right, third story on his home uh, in 96 East Grand Avenue in Scarborough. Uh, what he's requesting specifically is a 2.5 foot decrease in the side yard setback. Uh, it's, it, it presently exists on the property at that particular location. The, the present wall on the, as you're facing it from the road, the left side of the house uh, is exactly 12 and a half feet, where 15 feet is required. Um, he has the required yard setbacks, side yard setbacks on three sides. Uh, this particular wall was constructed over 40 years ago uh, in 1971, uh, and uh, you have two submissions that shows it, the uh, measurement uh, 12 and a half feet from the present side yard setback. Um, he's also submitted architect's drawings for the plans um, uh, that he, for the existential story that he'd like, stories that he'd like to construct. Um, we believe that the uh, application complies with zoning ordinance section 5B5, uh, the five conditions that uh, have been discussed earlier tonight. Uh, specifically, um, the existing homes and, sub and additions were uh, erected prior to July 3rd, 1991, it's 1971 as I stated earlier. The uh, reduction, uh, requested reduction is necessary to allow expansion in keeping with the scale of the surrounding ho wall homes to allow a smooth wall to go up. He would be allowed as of right to jog in two and a half feet and install this without the reduction of yard size, but that would add uh, both unnecessary expense and look kind of strange both aesthetically and architecturally. Um, in the neighborhood, it's, it's out on Pine Point. Uh, homes of this scale are common up and down on both sides uh, of the home that he's uh, uh, proposing to improve. Uh, number three, the requested reduction is necessary to build an appropriately sized, structurally sound additional story without uh, doing that job for no uh, essential reason and for allowing the use of existing wall and foundation for a smooth wall and improvement. Uh, quite frankly, many of the towns allow this as a right, but in this particular case, again, this was flagged uh, as he was drawing his plans. Uh, the impacts, number four, the impacts and effects of the granting of the application will not increase uh, uh, the impact on the neighborhood. It, it will remain in character with essentially everything that's around there. Uh, and the last criteria, obviously, uh, this is a building permit application uh, flagging of this issue, uh, even before I think they even talked to staff. Um, construction on the, on the proposed addition has not commenced. Uh, there was an additional issue uh, that Mr. Longstaff had, had flagged in terms of uh, uh, setback from, I think it's the high water mark. I, I did submit a, an additional, I don't want to mis, misphrase it, but the point is I, I submitted something that we believe shows that uh, that is not an issue in this case, the 75 foot setback. I didn't hear back from Mr. Longstaff, it was just submitted a couple days ago. I just wanted to confirm that the board does have that information and ask if there's any other concerns on that particular issue. I did hear from my clients this evening uh, that the DEP has issues. Uh, it was, it was not a permit not required. Has issued a permit not required finding. Uh, and so if the board had any questions about that issue, that uh, that's been addressed. Um, and at this point, I would request that the board uh, grant the application, and we're happy to answer any other questions. Thank you, Mr. Long, sir. Uh, this is the revised plan that was sent in. I didn't bother to to try to get it to you guys because it was so close to the date of the hearing. So I just made a copy. But the issue is the shoreline, shoreline setback, again, the highest annual tide line, and there's your 75-foot setback. The structure is clear back here. So the 30% expansion does not play into this proposal. Okay. So we don't have to deal with any of that, those you issues? You don't have to deal with those issues. However, we don't have a height on the structure, um, so we don't know if that's compliant or not. No, the limit for the height is 35, 35 feet. 35 feet to the mid mid to the midpoint of the roof um, taken should, on the... There should have been uh, a plan that was submitted that showed... Uh, one there of was a plan, but it only showed the height of the addition. It didn't give the total height of the structure. It's, it's a, do you want to step up and it would be a building permit issue right. at that point, but it would be nice for the board to know whether or not it's going to meet that. Thank Weinstein applicant here. We did go over the plans in depth with a prior building inspector, Dave Griffin. 
and that was one of the concerns. We went over it, and it didn't meet all the requirements of the architect at that time. Um, I don't see the uh, in-law apartment or the uh, accessory apartment that you'd come for an approval back a while ago. Did you never do that? Did you never put the accessory unit in? That's constructed. It's an adjacent structure. Oh, it's a different garage. Structure. Yeah, behind that's the one that's labeled as a garage? Yes. yes. Okay. And just a note, if, Chairman, if you if you wouldn't mind, as a note, uh, follow up on that. I believe the condition of that accessory approval was that Mr. Weinstein made made this uh, made this location his residence. That's correct. Uh, that's correct. And I note that on the application, it is not listed as his residence. His residence is listed in Old, Old Orchard Beach. I believe it's a 196 Taco Ave address. Yeah, that's Mr. Weinstein's office. But it's, I mean, driver's license, whatever we need, car registrations. He's a resident of Scarborough. It really has no bearing on this appeal other than he, if he's not currently residing there, he is in a state of nonconformance. I understand that, that but we're, we're representing him, Mr. Weinstein, to have to testify uh, that he is, he's a legal resident of Scarborough. We were well aware of that provision when we had the approval in the 2006, 5, whatever. Right. Ms. Weinstein, could you stand up, please, and take the um, I'm the one that actually brought that point to you back then. I said, be careful, because it might bite you. Um, so you're, you're stating at this point that you are, if this is your primary residence, you continue to live at this location? Yes. Okay. And this is, in essence, a... a you're testifying in, at, at subject to uh, violations of, of, for perjury. I just want to make sure you know that you're telling the truth. I don't want to put you in a spot, so I don't want to make it awkward. Because, and the reason I'm asking is because I had some information I thought that was in here that didn't say that you were currently living there. And I just want to make sure you're okay with that, just because I don't want to cause a problem for you. It's not an accusation. Nothing more than just a defensive play for me. To That's fine. Okay. So you, as far as you're at, that's your own address, and you can, and again, if you're not living there and you're not using the accessory unit, then it doesn't matter. But if you use it, okay. Thank you. Um, okay, let's, uh, do we have any letters on this one? We do not. And uh, any phone calls, nothing? Why not open the public to anybody who wish to speak in this session? Feel free to take the microphone, state your name. Material for being brought to, uh, to the table. Is there a reason, um, Ms. Daggett? I'm Sally Daggett. I'm here on behalf of Peter and Stephen Gross, the owners of Beach Realty Trust. And the reason this is delayed is because actually the notice that was sent to Mr. Gross in Massachusetts was sent by the town of Scarborough without any postage. So then it came back to Scarborough Town Hall and it wasn't received until late last week. So uh, I hope you will all uh, understand the reason for the lateness of this submission. It's really just a two-page uh, letter with some uh, attachments that I think are some things you've probably seen before. Um, again, I'm here on behalf of the Gross Brothers, who are the trustees of Beach Realty Trust. And if you look at the letter with the handouts attached, I just presented to you. If you look at Exhibit 1, which is a GIS aerial photo, you can see the location of my client's property in relation to Mr. Weinstein's house. Um, You've only got how many copies do we have here? We, we I've got it, it, it's, uh, Carol okay. doesn't have Are there any. enough copies? I have more copies. If you need. Yeah, that would be great if we could have a couple okay. more. I guess so. Is there any other copy now? Yes. yes. Let 
Let us have, have a chance to kind of decipher this, okay? It's, uh, I don't like getting surprises, to be honest with you. And I appreciate that. Um, My clients don't either, so. <laughs> um, Are you aware this is not a variance appeal? Well, that's one of uh, the items I would like to discuss with the board. Mr. Chair, can I recommend we take a 10-minute recess so we have a chance to review this? Sure. Uh, we'll recess and come back at uh, 9.25. Thank you.
just kind of confirming the camera room that we're back on. We're ready. Okay. Okay, we're back in session uh, and uh, had a chance to read the information that's been provided uh, by Ms. Daggett. Uh, based on what I'm reading, fair, uh, I move the table. I don't think it's fair to the applicant. I don't think it's fair to us. A lot of this material is uh, outside of my scope, and I think we need to have the table and bring this back next month. I, I agree with what the chairman's saying. I, I've been looking through some of the statutes that we have to look at, and I can't tell whether they're, this has merit or not. And until we have more time to review it, then I don't think I could give a good opinion or a bad opinion based on that. And I think in, in addition to that, I believe that we probably need to get the town attorney involved in this just to, to confirm our findings. May I address? Yes, I'm going to agree with that as well. Oh. Uh, just, uh, just get on the mic. Sure. Yeah. There are the, I'm, I saw at least one other gentleman come up here. Frankly, uh, I, I'm not opposed generically to the motion to the table, but I'd like to hear the presentation that the, uh, a butter, the, uh, whoever, whomever the uh, attorney Daggett represents, as well as the other gentleman that wanted to get up here and speak. I mean, we're all here tonight. Let's move it forward as much as we possibly can. Uh, maybe some of the issues we can clarify. I see Mr. Longstaff reading <laughs> furiously through some of the re regulations, but uh, at least I'd like to see it put more of the issues on the table for the next return if we're going to go that route. I have no problem with that. I'm fine with that. Okay. Thank you. Right, Ms. Zaget, why don't we let you go ahead and take the, the microphone and uh, uh, we'll discuss uh, your concerns. Thank you. Again, uh, Sally Daggett on behalf of Peter and Stephen Gross of Beach Realty Trust. The Grosses are uh, object to the proposed, uh, and we believe that this is, in fact, a variance um, in order to allow the property owner to construct a third floor addition into the side yard setback um, for two reasons. Reason number one, the house is clearly located in the shoreland overlay zone, so it must comply with all of the provisions of the shoreland zoning ordinance. And under your shoreland zoning ordinance, there is no limited side yard setback standard. Um, and this is a variance. <laughs> the applicant is requesting to be two and a half feet, or feet into the setback, closer than um, <coughs> permissible under the uh, R4A zoning district. Um, I think you can, there's no question from the applicant's uh, plot plan or site plan that while the house isn't within 75 feet of whether it's the high water mark or I, I haven't seen this new plan, I guess just apparently got submitted, um, whatever mark the uh, town of Scarborough is using, the house is very clearly w within 250 feet of uh, within the shoreland zone. And so for that reason, uh, it's the undue hardship test in the shoreland zoning ordinance that applies. Um, it, it, this limited side yard provision doesn't apply when the, there's a more restrictive provision um, your shoreland zoning ordinance specifically says the more restrictive provision applies. That means it's the, the undue hardship test. It's a very difficult test, as you know from the appeal you just heard tonight, uh, right before the, this appeal. Um, it's a very, the four-part undue hardship test is very difficult to meet, and uh, the planning, or the property owner hasn't even applied under that standard, and they can't meet the four undue hardship standards. Um, they already have a reasonable return on the property. The, they already have a good-sized two-story house uh, on the property, plus they have a garage with a accessory dwelling unit on the property. It's not a hardship to build the house, whether they jag in two and a half feet. Um, this is just for aesthetic reasons and uh, for architecturally pleasing reasons, but that's not what the undue hardship test is about. Um, this uh, this uh, request for the two and a half foot variance is for the owner's convenience. Um, the second part of the four-part undue hardship test is uh, are there any unique circumstances of the property that justify the variance? And there are no unique circumstances um, that justify this request. Um, and we believe the variance will alter the essential character of the neighborhood. Um, there are not uh, lots of, or to our knowledge, 
any other three-story home, homes in the neighborhood. If you look at exhibit number three, which is a sort of panoramic photograph, this is taken standing on the beach looking to the left towards Old Orchard and to the right up Pines Point. And you can see all the houses there on the, on the beach are not three-story houses. They're one- or two-story houses. Um, so we believe this will uh, alter the essential character of the neighborhood. So that's um, reason number one why the grocers are opposed to this variance request. Reason number two is that even if you believe that the undue hardship test doesn't apply, which we think would be an error of law and would be overturned in court, um, to the extent the board finds that it's just this limited yard size test it's in the zoning ordinance that applies. We don't believe that the property owner meets even that test. Um, if you turn to the ordinance provisions, uh, which are on page 29 of the ordinance, there are five separate criteria. We're not fussing about criteria number one or criteria number five, but we are fussing about criteria number two, three, and four. With regard to uh, criteria number two, the requested setback reduction is not reasonably necessary to permit the owner occupant to use and enjoy the property in the same manner as other similar properties in the zoning district. The owner occupant is already using the property, both the house and the garage with the accessory dwelling unit for residential purposes, just like the similar properties in the neighborhood. With regard to the third criteria under section 5B5A, of the zoning ordinance. There's nothing about the physical features of this lot or the location of the house uh, uh, that makes it impractical to construct the proposed expansion in conformance with the currently applicable 15-foot uh, setback. The applicant has admitted that uh, he can jag in two and a half feet, but that again, he, he thinks that's displeasing both architecturally and aesthetically. Well, that's uh, displeasing architecture and aesthetics, those aren't the test under the ordinance. Um, with regard the, to criteria number four under the zoning ordinance, the impact of this third story addition to the house, um, we believe will um, be substantially different or greater than the impacts or effects of a um, house that does conform to the yard size requirements. Um, in that three stories, uh, three story height is just not typical for the neighborhood. If you look at the photographs that have been attached to my letter, uh, exhibit number four, this is, these are two photographs, the view of the existing two-story house on the property, and my client's property is the one as, as you're looking from the beach. It's immediately adjacent to the house, but set back a little bit. It's the low-lying one-story house uh, set back, um, again, immediately to the right of the Weinstein house. So that's the, um, and if you turn to exhibit number five, this is a view from my client's uh, front porch towards the beach, towards the ocean, and you can see the house uh, right in front of the white house. That is a, um, a neighbor's property, but it's the brown house to the right. That is the two-story house that uh, is owned by Mr. Weinstein. Um, so for those reasons, the grocers object to this proposed variance, and we believe it is the variance request, and that's why we believe that the four-part undue hardship test applies. Um, we do also have some questions about the proposal. Uh, we can't tell what the height of this proposed structure is from the plans that were submitted, so we would like to know what the height of the um, structure is. Um, and we believe also, and I know the board has said this isn't really its issue, but the board brought the issue up. We do not believe that this property is being used by Mr. Weinstein as his residence. He's not either living in the house or in the accessory dwelling unit. Um, <laughs> the chronology from, and I think it's only Mr. Maroon who was here back in um, 2006, I think it was, that we were all here. I can just find my chronology. Excuse me, in December of 2005, that's when this board gave an approval uh, to Mr. Weinstein to build a second story on the garage structure on the property. If you look at our exhibit number one, you can see uh, it's labeled as ADU. That was what used to be a one-story garage, and in December of 2005, this board approved um, 
allowing Mr. Weinstein to build a second story on that garage where there's a, now an accessory dwelling unit. But one of the conditions of the approval was that Mr. Weinstein had to live in either the accessory dwelling unit or in the house. And at the time, Mr. Weinstein didn't live there, and so he had to do some shuffling. And um, when he applied for the building permit, he in 2006, he still yet didn't have a legal address in Scarborough. But then when he applied for a certificate of occupancy uh, in January of 2008, he finally had actually changed his voter registration from Old Orchard Beach to Scarborough. And then uh, the certificate of occupancy issued. That was in January of 2008. Well, then, sure enough, in September, or excuse me, October 29th of 2008, so uh, nine months after he got his certificate of occupancy, he changed his voter registration back to Old Orchard Beach. And I confirmed the same with Toady Justice, the town clerk, on Thursday of last week. And I have here a printout. I apologize. I didn't realize this issue would be coming up tonight. But um, here is Mr. Weinstein's um, voter registration information, and it shows his residence address is 5 Sunset Drive, unit number 12 in Old Orchard Beach. Again, we understand this is maybe code I'm not sure why that's issue. relevant. I, I guess the issue. board brought it up, and you even questioned Mr. Weinstein about whether he was a resident of Scarborough, and I'm just saying there is information out there, and I would like to submit this to the board. I apologize, I only have okay. one copy, but uh, it clearly shows he is currently registered to vote in Old Orchard Beach, and I guess we would ask that the Code Enforcement Office follow up on this issue. I understand it may not be the Board of Appeals' issue, but we think um, it's significant that there's a history here of saying one thing and then doing another. So, okay. thank you very much. Are there any other comments or issues? Okay. Unless the Board members have any questions, I'm pleased well, to respond. We'll hold off on the questions, I think. But okay. Uh, there went, uh, there's another gentleman that wishes mm -hmm. to speak. You can state your name and address. We'll go from there. Paul Tobias, Grand Beach, LLC, which is 11, 11th Street. The abutter to the applicant, direct abutter. Uh, that would be the, is that the White House? Yes, the ocean front. Okay. So, traditional, it's a traditional kind of a... Um, 1890, cottage. Yeah, okay. Summer use only. Uh, just, uh, I've got some the sketchy drawings, and I've already talked to uh, Mr. Longstaff on several occasions and got most of my questions answered. Uh, just one lately was the, uh, I was concerned looking over the drawings that I had, which wasn't a complete set, was there is a porch to the ocean side of uh, the applicant's house. And I was just wondering if that was going to be enclosed in, even though it's even with the house. You know what I'm saying? Are you referencing the porch closest to your property? Yes. So if he's going up the third story, would that, like, go out to that? Is that allowed? You know, I, I can see he's basically following the footprint, but I couldn't, I don't have any other drawings to know that that's part of the enclosed house. That's all I have. Okay. Um, okay. Thank you. I'm saying, I don't know if you know the answer to that or not. Mm -hmm. uh, what, yeah, anybody else wish to speak on the public issue here? So I'm going to close the public hearing part. Thank you. Yes, that issue has a deck on the ocean side that will stay as it is. Okay, so it'll still be nice. Yeah, the other floor will be directly over the existing footprint of the exterior walls of the building. That will just be an outside deck as is. Does that clarify that? Yeah. Okay. Mr. Tatum? And that is the point. I mean, we're, we're trying to go up in the existing footprint and not have it jog out. That is the issue that's in front of you. I'm all offended because it's clear that the, um, uh, the uh, attorney Daggett's clients had wind of this way before five minutes ago when we, or 20 minutes ago when we got this uh, 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 documentation, and it would have been helpful. Uh, to have at least seen it even this afternoon, and I probably could have researched some of this issue on 
whether there should be a variance or not. I mean, uh, they set up a straw man argument and then knocked it down. This is within 250 feet, ergo it's got to be a variance rather than a limited reduction in yard size. That, has been not, that hasn't been flagged today. Um, that is the only issue. The issue is not third story or not. The issue is does the third story under, under what the application has, that we've put forth in front of this board should be over two and a half feet or not. That's the only, that's the only issue here. It's, it's, there is a right to do the, uh, the third story under our view of this. Um, and that's all I can respond to right now because I was just handed to this half an hour ago. Thank you. Um, and based on um, those statements, exactly how I feel, it's, I think we need to table this um, till the next meeting. And so I'll move to table. Second. All in favor? It's unanimous. This will be tabled till the next meeting. And just for record's sake, for clarification, um, yeah, for uh, the reason for the table is because of the, the information we need to get, and also the uh, applicants got right to information. Right, so the next appeal is appeal number 2509. It's a variance appeal by Cynthia and Mark King, 81 Jones Creek Road, assistance map U21, lot 8 to, uh, to elevate and renovate a home with non-conforming setbacks on the front side and rear in the R4A zone. And uh, Representative? Uh, good evening, members of the uh, Zoning Board of Appeal. My name is Tom Blackburn. I'm here on behalf of Mark and Cynthia King. Uh, they, per they are a, uh, um, they're the owners of a cottage at 81 Jones Creek Road. And what they are doing is, and the existing condition of the property is that it is below the current uh, floodplain elevation. The uh, finished floor elevation is uh, 9.8 feet, which uh, is, is non is in non-compliance with uh, Scarborough's code, and they, under the existing floodplain, under the proposed uh, FEMA flood maps, it would be substantially uh, uh, non-compliant. And so, what they're seeking is the um, the ability to elevate the house so to make it uh, uh, compliant with the new, uh, with the existing uh, floodplain as well as the new proposed FEMA floodplain. Okay. Uh, and so, that it, again, they're planning to raise the property and then rebuild it? It's just Well, all they're going to do is just go straight up and they're going to add a, a bathroom within the enclosed porch in the back. So there's no expansion of the footprint. The only expansion would be the stairs necessary to access the property. And they, those are, are they forward of the... Of the uh, no, they're not. They're in the back side. So you're basically just taking the exact footprint you've got Removing the house, putting a new home putting in place, just goes meeting out. all the codes that are required for uh, Shoreland Zone. And no, they're all free. Compliance. They're all free of that. They're all free of that. So this is triggering variance. Why? This is a variance. This is a variance because the way our ordinance reads, and I put that in the summary that you all have in your packet that uh, Section 3C1 of the Scarborough Zoning Ordinance states that no building or structure which is non-conforming with respect to space and bulk requirements of this ordinance may be expanded, enlarged, or increased in height unless such expanded or enlarged portion complies with the space and bulk requirements of this ordinance or the Board of Appeals grants relief from such requirements by variance under Section BB3, or 5B3, excuse me. Um, so, so it's kind of like You've got to raise the structure to comply, but now you have to go ask permission to raise the structure to comply. <laughs> that makes sense. That's the juxtaposition, I guess. I don't that's know if okay. that's the proper use of that term, but uh, that's kind of where we find ourselves. With this. It's really a kind of a hiccup in our ordinance, which I hope to correct sometime in the next few years <laughs> so that we don't have to do this again. But uh, All right, so uh, do we have any letters on this? We do not. Okay. Well, I'll open up the public hearing. Anybody wish to speak on this one? Just feel free to take the microphone, state your name and address, and we'll go from there. My name is Tom Bartels. I'm at 14 Avenue 5, and I'm a direct butter on the rear. Could you spell your last name for us, please, sir? B-A-R-T-E-L-S. Just as it sounds. Okay. Um, um, my only, I only have one question, and it's probably 
quite evident. Um, there's a shed in the back there, and I assume that shed will stay in the same spot. Um, I, the, the shed is actually there. Um, I've been with the town for years. Uh, the shed is actually was not put there by permit. Um, and uh, I just want to make sure that that won't be touched. That won't be touched, Joe. Right. Uh, would you like to sit? Feel free. So you're talking, there's, there's a wood platform and then the shed's in the middle there. It's my understanding none of those things will change. Um, is that the right answer? <laughs> no, that was that for blunt. I'm, I'm not sure. Are you seeking, are you seeking that it to be moved or? No. I mean, I, uh, you shouldn't be talking to me. I mean, it's like open up another can of worms to that shed uh, was placed there illegally about five years ago. Uh, I checked with the assessor. There's since 1925. There's been no recording of a shed there. So I'll make sure that that shed, that in my estimation is illegal, stays where it is. That's all. Okay. Thank you. It's my, it's my understanding that that they have no intention of uh, changing anything, but I. Changing the location of the shed, or there's a wooden deck. But on the other hand, I, I, I do not want to represent that, that they may want to remove that shed at some point. Sure. I mean, they bought it with the they bought the property uh, as is, and I'm not sure what their plans with respect to that are. Sure. Very good. I'm, I'm, I'm glad that the issue is brought forward. I mean, in this proposal here, it's strictly saying as. We're only talking about the, the structure itself. Exactly. Mm. So it's, uh, the other issue uh, can be dealt outside the board. Okay. You're welcome. Okay. Thank you. So no more else from the public? I'll close the public hearing. I'll come back. Um, this, in my opinion, is a little bit easier variance. And this is a classic example of the variance appeal. Mm -hmm. um, why don't we go through the requirements of that? And uh, the first one, the land in question cannot yield a reasonable return unless the variance is granted. And if you'd like to take a position on that, that's true. And explain why, please. Uh, well, if, if the if the uh, property is not allowed to be elevated, and we were to experience a flood, and uh, under the proposed uh, uh, flood maps, it would be uh, about five feet underwater. So that in, in itself, I believe, would uh, render the property uh, of no value. Or limited value. Okay. And also, it's my understanding that under the current, um, uh, under the proposed uh, FEMA regulations, if you do not meet these proposed regulations when they become uh, effective, there's a uh, there's a substantial penalty that is implied um, each year as a surcharge to your flood insurance premium, which would adversely affect their uh, um, value of their property. I'm sure there's no coincidence there either. Uh, okay, number two, the need for the variance is due to the unique circumstances of the property and not due to the general conditions in the neighborhood. Yeah, the property is, is as it is when they acquired it. Uh, it was built in the 1920s. It basically was below, uh, the front of the house is actually below grade at this point. So, uh, uh, The granting of the variance will not alter the essential character of the neighborhood or locality. Uh, there's been a number of houses uh, surrounding this property that have been elevated, and it's, we're just uh, complying with the uh, with the Scarborough Code. And the hardship is not a result of the app of the applicant or prior owner. No. Okay. Good. All right. Um, back to the board for questions, comments, or a motion. Well, I don't, with, with no uh, footprints change or anything, I don't see any reason that we would have to, to question this. That seems pretty straightforward to me. Move to approve Appeal 2509. Second. Discussion on the motion? None? All in favor? Unanimous. Thank you. Thank you very much.
appeal is appeal number 2510. It's a uh, reapproval of a variance appeal by Patrick Dimmick, uh, 3 Shipwreck Road, Sussex Map U1, parcel 83 to demolish and reconstruct the home 12 feet 6 inches from the front property line and 0 feet from the property line in the side property line in the R4 zone. And, uh, good evening. Good evening. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, for the record, my name is Jim Fisher with Northeast Civil Solutions, here this evening representing Mr. Dimmick. Um, you may recall that we were here not so long ago, uh, back in July, when we got a uh, unanimous approval for the variance for this particular project. The variance we are seeking is a um, the reconstruction of a house uh, in its exact same footprint on the lot where it is right now. Uh, you may also recall that we are not able to move that house even if we wanted to because the DEP's regulator, the state's regulations, basically say that, uh, sorry, you can't do that. You can build in the same footprint or rebuild in the same footprint, but you cannot expand it horizontally. There is a 30% planned expansion to this uh, uh, structure, which will be about a third of the second floor. Uh, and other than that, everything is exactly the same as you would see it now. We're here just because the original construction schedule, which was, was out, as, started as uh, far back as uh, this past early summer, uh, had originally intended to have all the various contractors and subcontractors that are typically needed in something of this caliber, plus a, a pile driver, which is a little bit more of a challenge to, uh, to get out at the sites, so I understand, uh, was scheduled for late October. Uh, we were contacted uh, in late, very late October, right around on Halloween, actually, um, and uh, by Mr. Demick, who was in a bit of a panic. He doesn't understand these types of uh, or this industry as an overall and said, my contractors have told me that they cannot coordinate their schedules now until the middle of January. We're here a little bit earlier than that because we wanted to make sure that the, our approval actually expires uh, on January 9th, and we wanted to make sure that we had enough time to be able to just extend that uh, for another six-month period. Uh, the schedule is currently scheduled to, uh, to start in January, in the middle of January. Who really knows? But uh, he apparently did read the riot, riot act to his contractors and said, a few weeks is one thing, three months is another. I need to start this process. Toward that end, we're just asking for an extension of the approval that we already received. Thank you. Mr. Longstaff, anything good? No? Want to open public hearing? Anybody wish to speak on this issue? Close public hearing. That to me, this is pretty straightforward. Um, I have a motion uh, just to extend. Approve appeal 2510 as presented. Second. Oh, any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all in favor? It's extended. Thank That's you. extended from uh, Mr. Longstaff. Is that extended from this date or from January date? January. I think it would be January. January. That was my understanding. Yeah. I just want to make sure I confirmed it, just in case. It's a good uh, question, but I think it's changed. In case he doesn't have luck with his target. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I hope it will be better this time around. By the way, the speed limit is 20 miles an hour there. <laughs> <laughs> that hurts. You could have tabled you. And the next appeal is appeal number 2511. It's a variance appeal by Anita Pellet, 21 Massacre Lane. This is map U17, parcel 18, to relocate and renovate a home one foot from the rear property line, zero feet from the sideline, and uh, 13 feet from the front property line in the R2 zone. Welcome. Hi. Uh, my name is Trevor Watson. For Eider Investments, I represent the Palais. Uh, so not only is this a variance appeal, um, but I also have some prize documentation. Okay. Are they willing to see updated drawings? Sure. Should we table, Mr. Chair? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So are these drawings consistent with? They are consistent. Uh, they are consistent in, in footprint and size and sort of division of uh, division of space. Some, some of the interior partitions have changed, and there's a slight change on the second story, which went from an uh, enclosed structure to an open porch. Okay. So the, uh, the Palais are looking uh, for variance to, let me move this, looking for a variance to, uh, uh, similar to the previous uh, proposal, there's a uh, a good a significant portion of the uh, existing play house is not currently on the property. And so the plays are looking to uh, demolish uh, the existing structure and are proposing to build a new structure that is uh, 
um, smaller in footprint and increases the setbacks. Um, so we're, we're looking to uh, reduce the, the coverage from 34.3%, which as exists, to 30%, and we're looking to increase the front yard setbacks from uh, roughly uh, 10.8 feet to 13 feet, uh, the rear yard setback from uh, negative to one foot, and the side yard setback from negative to zero. Um, the lot is pretty tough in that it's very small and there's no uh, legal building envelope on it. The front yard setback and the rear yard setback overlap. So um, uh, that's, that's the summary. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Um, we've got new letters on this. So, yeah. Oh, I have an email too. George Belshaw. Uh, Trevor, we do not object to the placement of the house as long as the ground level is consistent with the abutters and is of porous material like sand or gravel. The drawings do not indicate, I'm sorry, drawings do not include any placement of utilities, exhaust fans, or other exterior placed appliances. Please provide us for that information. We have I, the address on that, Mr. Uh, this is, uh, I haven't found it yet. He's uh, 22 Garrison Lane. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Ida and its subcontractors will need access to our property at 22 Garrison Lane for construction purposes. Please provide us with insurance that states coverage of our property from any damage, negligence resulting from the work performed on 21 Massacre Lane. Should have blacked out most of that. And that's, uh, you understand that to be accurate? Mm -hmm. Yes, that's accurate. I've since responded to Mr. Belshaw and uh, answered his questions. Okay. And this looks like a second one from, is that? Um, oh, it may be a redundancy. It's the same one. Um, this one here is from Alex Smith. Uh, I don't see an address on this one, but I'll read it. She's 25, Massacre Lane. 25, okay. I approve of an MPLA's project. I am her mother, Alexander White Smith, and I got the right answer. And I sold her part of my property, which abuts her land. If there's a problem before her hearing on December 11th, please call me at. Uh, thank you, uh, Alexandra Smith. So she'll still be invited to Christmas parties, I guess. I hope so. The next one is um, from 27 Massacre Lane, uh, Meredith Webster. I'm writing you this brief note today in support of Anita Pelé's um, my, my Immediate Neighbor on Massacre Lane. I'm thrilled that they are renovating and improving their houses. It will enhance the neighborhood and make things nicer for all of us. I would ask you to extend to them every courtesy possible to have the construction go forward quickly as possible. I'm thrilled to have my adjacent houses cared for and attractive. It makes it better for everyone. Meredith Webster. And the last one is uh, from Bev McGraw. Um, this is from 68 Sulky Lane. Uh, thank you for the notice. I'll not be able to attend the public hearing on December 11, 2013, so I'm writing my objections to you for consideration. I oppose the variance as stated. There's absolutely no justification for bringing a building to be placed one foot from the proper rear property line and or zero feet from the east side line. Additionally, the plays have shown disregard for the correct east side line by placing live rocks and bushes actually in the roadway. It is my concern that they will attempt to pass that off as their own east line? Not so. I have a survey map and would be willing to share it with you. The original marker is in the front right of my property and was placed there when my grandfather built my cottage in the very early 1900s. Please keep me informed as to the appeal. Uh, Beverly McGraw, 20 Massacre Lane. Okay. And I want to open the public hearing. Anybody from the public wants to speak on this? And nobody else wants the public hearing. Okay, so this is a variance appeal. Uh, Mr. Longfellow, anything to add on this one? Sorry. <laughs> Thinking of Longfellow for um, I don't really have anything uh, further to add other than you know, what's included in the summary. It's again one of the. I don't know what Eider does to to inherit these these uh, <laughs> these problems, but <laughs> this is another ridiculous lot that the building isn't even on, and they're trying to move it back onto the lot, reduce it, and reduce the nonconformance, and get it all on the property where where 
where it should have been. Um, you know, again, I, I don't know how you, I don't know how you view hardship in a case of this, but it's it's like there's no win here. There's no way to win with this other than, I guess the win is it finally gets to be put on the property where it should be, not in a building envelope because there is no building envelope. But you know how difficult this variance. The A question on variance is to say yes to. This is perfectly a perfect example of why we need it, because how can you yield a reasonable return with a structure that goes on another property, and he's bringing it back onto the existing property line? I mean, that's that's really why you do that, in my opinion. That's just a I, perfect I think, example of how you use this. I think that that's probably the only way you can look at it is if they went to sell it, the appraisal. And, and, would, and discovery would say it's not on its own property. Therefore, you cannot sell something that you've you lost don't serious own. value by doing that. Exactly. So I guess so. that in yeah, I guess that's one way to look at that hardship. Yeah. Um, uh, one question for you on the on the setbacks. Sure. Are you including the eaves on that one foot? Or is that yes. So it's so really you're going to have like a foot. Yeah. It's 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 significant. Yeah. It's more. Okay. And can I should I can I answer? I think. Mrs. McGraw is mistaken. Can I answer that? Uh, the, uh, the one letter? Sure. Do, do I need to? Okay, don't so. don't know if you have to, but feel free. Uh, so she, she mentioned she's, uh, she's across the street, so the rear setback impacts Mr. Belsh, George Belshaw, who spoke in favor of it. Uh, the side yard setback impacts Mrs. Smith and um, uh, uh, What's the, the Meredith Webster, and they both spoke in favor of it, and uh, we're actually increasing the front yard setback, which most directly impacts Mrs. McGraw, from 10.86 feet to 13 feet, as proven by the survey. And I think she's also mistaken as to the road designation in the in in her understanding of it. Uh, if you look at the if you look at the front if you look at the first page you can see Massacre Lane you can see the property line and there's a thin line there that that's the driveway cut out and then it, it it's it's held onto the property of the Palais and that that line actually designates the driveway uh, sorry the road Massacre Lane. Thank you. Why don't we go through the uh, requirements for a variance and uh, start with. Uh, the land in question cannot yield a reasonable return unless a variance is granted. Sure. So this is not. This is a couple couple of different elements here. Um, a lot of the mechanicals of the structure are below the uh, of the house are below the first floor and in the floodplain. Um, so uh, again, we're talking about a substandard structure that's uh, supported uh, on piers, on wooden piers, on flat stones, on wooden piers on ground. Um, uh, you know, the, the, it's it's falling into a state of disrepair. The the, the floors are, are are very uneven. The there's a significant elevation change in the floors of eight inches uh, throughout the house, as shown on the elevation certificate. So, and additionally, uh, you guys have already touched on it. Uh, sort of the the nonconformity of this structure and the fact that the house doesn't exist entirely on its property makes. Um, you know, clouds the title and makes resale a, a real nightmare, and uh, it, it really reduces the marketability of, of the property. So, um, you know, and just finally, you know, the limited ability to make uh, significant improvements to the structure that's not on their property. Okay. Uh, the uh, needs of the variance is due to the unique circumstances of the property and not the general conditions of the neighborhood. Uh, that's cor that's correct. The property again is six you know six thousand plus square feet. It's small. There's no legal building envelope. It's uh, the you know the the property is unique. Uh, the granting of variance will not alter the essential character of the locality. Uh, that's correct because we're bringing you know we're bringing the structure entirely onto the property and we're updating the structures. We're going to you know modernize it, current codes, life safety issues. And the hardship is not a result of an action taken by the applicant or prior owner. That's right. The, the house was built uh, prior to the um, road width requirements and the you know current Scarborough zoning ordinance w that were enacted. Okay. Thank you. Um, to me, this is pretty straightforward. This is another example of a, of a variance where there's not much just to me. Yeah. Uh, comments, questions, or motion? I move to approve 2511. 
Um, as submitted. Seconded. Discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all in favor? Unanimous. Thank you. Thank Great. You. Thank you very much. thing I did notice on the uh, agenda that we had I'm sure there, uh, on the excuse me on the agenda that we had for the this evening yes. there were two appeals number 2509 you've hit okay thank you Carol thank you first he's always on the good okay thank you but the numbers don't really matter we I didn't get the memo <laughs> <laughs> um Mr. Long Steph anything to add for tonight comments sir uh, no, other than if you know of anyone who would like to apply for the position of chairman, I think we need, or the chairman, uh, Carol, or just zoning board in general. Zoning board in general? Zoning board in general, because I do believe you are correct that your term is going to expire. Yeah. And, um, but we would, I think, if the board pleases, maybe entertain a an indication for me if you would continue until a replacement is found. Uh, would uh, I'm fine to stay as long as yeah. mm -hmm. On what date does, uh, does the chairman terminate? Nice way to say You're going to enjoy that little tomorrow. I don't know the exact date of when the term expires. Okay. I didn't get that information, but I did hear from, to I did get see an email from Toady Justice, the town clerk, that. Uh, should be January. Should be January. It's only That's all I have. It's like eggs. Um, a rough meeting night tonight. Uh, a lot of tough items. So, uh, thank you everybody for the courtesy. Appreciate your courtesy. Um, <laughs> Sounds good for you. Right? Any uh, other comments from the board or a motion to close? Adjourn. Wish you all happy holidays. Yes. Thank you. You too. Motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? That's unanimous. We're adjourned. Have a nice night. Thank you.